I spent last summer backpacking and hitchhiking from Knoxville to New York. Having just finished my sociology degree, I figured I'd do something bucket listy before starting my new job in early September. I've always loved spontaneous travel, to just go where the wind takes me, and that summer was the first time I had the money to do so with some comfort. I could stay at the occasional motel, hop on a train, or just take a cab every now and then. I had options, and I wanted this to be my final youthful adventure before I got stuck in the rat race. I made my way up through Kingston, Princeton and Beckley, heading northeast. I hitchhiked most of the way, but I sometimes had to walk for hours before someone pulled over to give me a ride. I even had a cardboard sign saying, New York, New York. But man, it gets rough out there. Nothing to protect you from sudden rain, and there's no guarantee you'll find a place to stay before it gets dark, and you don't want to fall asleep when you're getting a ride from someone. Safety first. By the time I got to the small town of Juniper, I was exhausted. I stopped at a cafe to get some directions and a bite to eat. Got myself a smiling little blue sunflower pin. Some kind of local charity thing. What can I say? The thing was next to a wanted poster of two kids. I felt bad. As I didn't know a lot of the people in the area, and I'd been walking for the better part of the past two days, I decided to catch a greyhound going north. Not too far, just enough to get me to Morgantown. I knew some people there, and figured a shower and a warm home-cooked meal would turn my frown upside down. I asked the cashier for directions. Horses don't stop in Juniper, she said. We don't get those. Strange. I stuck around for a couple of hours before I got back on the road. No one was looking twice at my cardboard plea, so I just had to keep going on my own. By that time, I learned exactly one thing about Juniper. That buses don't stop there. And I was about to learn a second thing that the roads are concrete garbage. I'd been walking for about two hours. It was getting dark. I was following the main road out of town when a piece of concrete got loose, causing me to slip and twist my ankle. I fell over by the roadside, clutching my foot and already seeing some bruising. Now, there was really no other option but to get a bus. I backtracked to a culvert down the road and found myself a piece of rebar that I could use as a walking stick. As the streetlights turned on, I was annoyed. I thought about calling for a cab, but I was in the middle of nowhere and didn't know how to describe it. I get anxious on the phone. Finally, just around the bend, I could see a bus stop. Just this little sign by the side of the road, not even a bench or anything but there was already a guy standing there, so I figured I was on the right track. I hobbled up there and plopped down at the side of the road. I tried to bandage my ankle and give it some support, but I'd have a hard time walking for the next few days either way. There was no getting away from that. All the while, the other guy kept staring at me. I had no idea what kind of bus went through there, but I figured if someone else was waiting for one, it couldn't be too far out of line. But judging from the way the other guy looked at me, something was off. At first look, there wasn't anything inherently strange about him. Just some guy in his early 40s, dirty jeans, rolled up flannel shirt, and a grey baseball cap. The only thing that kind of stood out was his scarf. It was this yellow pastel fleece type scarf which covered most of his neck. It looked a bit out of place, but not so much that I initially even thought about it. But the guy kept staring at me. There was something off about the way he looked at me, but I couldn't put my finger on it. Excuse me, I said. Do you know when the next bus gets here? No response, no acknowledgement of any kind, no nods or head shakes. Excuse me, sir, I repeated. 
Is there a bus coming? Still, nothing. I shrugged it off. Maybe he didn't speak English. But even then, he ought to have said something. I waited for the better part of an hour. The sky grew dark, and I was slowly coming to terms with having to sleep outside for the night, if need be. I had a tent. I'd be fine. Still, the creepy guy was still standing there, staring at me. He wasn't even checking his phone or anything. He just kept looking my way, pacing back and forth. I tried to put into words exactly what bothered me about him. The first thing I noticed were his eyes. They didn't seem to blink in unison. He would close one, open it, and then close the next one. And it wouldn't be a pattern. It was seemingly random, but quick. You wouldn't catch it at first glance. Secondly, there was his chest. When he stood still, I could see him take very shallow breaths. There was this faint noise coming from his nose, like micro whistles. At one point, there hadn't been a single car passing by for 15 minutes. Suddenly, the strange man walked up to me. He looked at me with those wild, random eyes. Can I help you? I asked. Do you... Before I could finish my sentence, he grasped the bus stop sign and tipped it over. He barely made an effort. An uncomfortable thought washed over me. Maybe he put that sign up in the first place. I took out my phone, as if to show him that I was ready to call for help if need be. I got up on my feet, leaning against my rebar crutch. There's no bus coming, is there? I asked. There was no response. Instead, he stopped pacing. Not just stopped as in stopped moving, but as in stopping so completely that it looked like he wasn't even breathing. The only thing moving was the size of his pupils, slowly growing wider, like a cat ready to pounce. Something in the back of my mind screamed at me to run, but my ankle didn't let me. I got about three steps down the road before he tackled me, sending us both reeling down a 15 feet slope. All the while, he kept taking these shallow breaths like an excited dog. I found myself face first in the dirt, with this stranger's body next to me, a dense pine forest stretching out for miles ahead. My head was spinning, trying to figure out what was even happening. As I scrambled to get back on my feet, I couldn't stop focusing on this one stupid detail. That his body was incredibly light. It was like getting tackled by a water balloon. By the time I got up, my attacker was ready to pounce again. Somewhere down the slope, I must have dropped my phone. I swung my piece of rebar in a wide arc, smacking him on the side of the head. It was like hitting a sandbag. It didn't even slow him down. Before I could build up the momentum to swing again, he grabbed me. It surprised me, making me trip over my own feet as he pulled me into the woods. He had this grip like a goddamn vice that just dug into my clothes, and he was much stronger than I anticipated. I was dragged along by my backpack. I managed to get it off and escape his grip for a moment, but before I could get away, those hands got me by the neck of my jacket. No matter how much I kicked and screamed, I could see the lights by the road disappearing further and further away. I got dragged through bushes, saplings and branches. Things were poking into my skin, tearing at my clothes. I could barely breathe, but I kept struggling. The man in the yellow scarf just kept pulling me further away from the light, all the while panting with rapid breaths. It didn't matter how much I screamed, squirmed or twisted, those hands weren't letting up. We battled for what felt like hours. I got out of my jacket and he grabbed me by the foot. I got my shoes off but he just grabbed my belt. After a while, I was just too tired to fight. I resigned to just holding onto whatever I could reach to try and slow him down. 
but all it did was bruise my hands. At some point, I just laid there, exhausted, as he dragged me further into the woods. The rough forest floor turned to soft grass as I was pulled into a field. The full moon was out, and I could see all the way through the clearing. The man in the yellow scarf suddenly stopped and inhaled a deep breath, his torso swelling up like a balloon. There was a faint crackle as his ribs readjusted. He was smelling something. I made an attempt to get up, but he just kicked me back down and put a foot on my torso. At the slightest movement, he would press down to keep me in check. There were others there. I could hear them shuffle through the tall grass. From where I lay, I could only see the top half of them. There were three of them in total. Two men and a woman. Two of them were carrying their own bus signs. All three of them were wearing scarves similar to that of my assailant. One of the men hissed. Actually hissed with his mouth wide open. He made this threatening stance and stepped forward. But my attacker didn't flinch. Instead, he hissed back. It wasn't a normal sound. It was like someone desperately trying to cough but never quite getting the phlegm out. I felt like prey, as they non-verbally argued about who gets the two. Something grabbed me by the neck. A fourth one, still wielding a bus stop sign. I was pulled away, and as my attacker flinched, they pounced on him. It escalated into a full-on brawl, but not like any fight I'd ever seen. They were contorting their bodies at impossible angles, their torso swelling and shrinking like blowfish. They kept thrusting their necks forward while their heads just bobbled back and forth. In the confusion, I started crawling. No one was looking at me. I crawled on my belly, trying to get away. My ankle was killing me. Every little bump sent a jolt of pain up my leg all the way through my spine. Suddenly, they all stopped. At the edge of the forest clearing, I could see yet another one. This one was much larger. A woman, easily 6'8". She was carrying a bus stop sign, this one of a slightly different model, and she had someone thrown over her shoulder. Another victim. Before I could react, hands grabbed me. My arms, my legs, my clothes and they started to drag me through the clearing. Whatever disagreements they'd had must have been cleared up by the presence of this leader character. Out of reflex, I tried to talk. I demanded that they listen to me, that they explain themselves, anything. I could hear my voice breaking as I got nothing but vacant expressions in return. These dumb, rolling eyes, all of them blinking at random, all of them taking shallow breaths. But this last one, the large one, she was something different entirely. She moved like her joints didn't matter. She bent her arms back and forth, and she kept swiveling her head like an owl. Her mouth was wide open, like she was constantly screaming, but she didn't make a sound, just a completely vacant expression. We got to a mound at the edge of the clearing, where they'd made a makeshift shelter. They dug into the dirt and covered it in branches and moss. It was also a sort of storage, with at least a dozen different signs. Stop signs, bus stop signs, and even a couple of simple benches. This was some sort of tactic to catch people who were either on their own, lost, or desperate. They utilized anything that could make a victim change their behavior to stop for a moment or wait. A large one dropped a person next to me. An overweight, balding man in his late twenties with some of the bluest eyes I'd ever seen. He was nodding in and out of consciousness and I could see deep bruises on his neck. He must have been choked out. As our five attackers started going through the collection of signs and symbols, I tried to wake the other victim. 
he was completely out of it, muttering something about white doors and gardens. I couldn't make sense of it. When he finally came to, he could barely form a coherent sentence. My first thought was that he needed medical attention. He was clearly unwell. Still, he was coming to. They... they got me at a... a red light, he wheezed. Pull, pulled me out of the car. They got me at a bus stop, had a fake sign. Do... do they want money? I got money. I don't think so. There was something deeply inhuman about these people. If they wanted money, they would have just killed me. No, they wanted something else, and that worried me. Before we got a chance to talk, they grabbed him by the foot and dragged him along the ground. The large woman didn't even flinch. This guy was easily 300 pounds, but she pulled him along like he was a bag of chips. He flailed and protested, the sleeve of his shirt getting stuck and pulled off on a sharp route. They all helped each other holding him down as he looked at me, calling for help. Those desperate, pale blue eyes, never seen anything like them before. The large one took off a scarf, revealing a massive wound in the middle of her throat. It still looked red and fresh, a throat wound leading all the way into her esophagus, showing the contracting raw musculature. That's where the whistling sound had come from. I could see it now. They weren't just taking shallow breaths. They were cycling their lungs. While one lung breathed in and out, the other did so at a different interval, like when you pedal a bike. One foot goes up, one goes down. That's why the chest moved so much. They were constantly taking breath. The whistling came from them inhaling and exhaling, seemingly simultaneously and continuously. These were something different entirely. The large woman leaned in close, hugging her victim, putting their neck against one another. Crunch, crunch, crunch. I had to do something, anything. I grabbed the sharp root with the ripped off shirt sleeve. I intended to use it as a weapon, swinging it wildly, but I couldn't get over the pain in my leg. There was no way I'd get away from them. They were fast and unharmed and could do things that I just couldn't. So I just sat there with my root, watching the large woman undulate with something large moving in and out of the wound in her throat, still with that expressionless face. I put all the things I knew together. They displayed a kind of social structure. They had an alpha. They had tactics. They need their victims alive for... something. And all of the people I was looking at were just... people. There was no pattern. Just broken, twisted people. So, I had to try something. Anything. Using the torn off sleeve, I tied it around my neck. Using the blue sunflower pin to hold it together. This was a rudimentary scarf in a way. Then I got up, and before the rest of them caught on, I walked up and stood next to my attacker, the man with the flannel shirt and yellow scarf. I tried to mimic their expressions. There was an immediate reaction. The man with the yellow scarf looked at me, then back at the others. They in turn just looked at the alpha. She leaned her head back, leaving the exposed wound in a victim open to the air. I could see something white moving in her throat, like a long white tongue retracting into her chest. There was a moment of silence as she observed us. She seemed confused. I tried to blink, seemingly at random, and take shallow breaths. I could feel something wet on my throat. Apparently, there was a little blood probably from my hands. The alpha got up, her head bobbing back and forth. She hissed, 
there was a vibration as something rattled in a chest. My attacker seemed agitated, and he pushed me away. I fell over next to the signs as the Alpha stormed forward, first to discipline my attacker with a show of force, and then to inspect me. I grabbed a stop sign and got up, letting the adrenaline flow through me. I couldn't show pain. I just couldn't. Rapid breaths, blink at random, head on a swivel. I had to look like them, or this was doomed to fail. The Alpha looked me over, making a rattling noise. She smelled the blood, poked at me, and presented a neck. I could see the wound just inches from my face, and all the way down her throat, I saw something bone white, rattling back and forth like a stick in a barrel. She reached for my sleeve scarf, held together by that pin. As her cold hands touched my neck, and her fingers started to bend into a grip, she suddenly stopped. The other victim was moving. I could have sworn he was dead, but now he was moving. A long, white branch-like appendage was moving out of his open neck, reaching for open air. And for a moment, the group just looked at him. His body screamed. Not him as a person, but his body. A long, drawn-out shriek. A grown body crying like a newborn, blood still spurting from his open wound. They all gathered around him. But as my assailant stepped forward, the Alpha hissed, causing him to retreat. Then, looking at me, it hissed again. It didn't like me, and it wanted me to leave. Both me and my assailant. Still holding the bus stop sign, I tried my best to confidently walk out of there. The sign had this heavy lead pipe that I could use to defend myself if need be. I got about 40 feet before I realized I was being followed. The man in the yellow scarf was still coming for me, and he seemed angry. But this time, I had a sturdier weapon. I tried to gain some ground to get away from the others. Whether they'd been tricked by my antics or just didn't like me didn't matter. It was just me and this... outcast. And as he charged me to wrestle me down again, I was ready. This time, I swung the bus stop sign in an overhead arc like I was chopping firewood. I closed my eyes, held my breath, and hit him square in the chest. This was much more effective, and he doubled over. I just started beating him over and over and over as his chest expanded and shrunk. As his scarf fell off, I could see something poking in and out of his neck wound, something white, looking for an opportunity to escape. It pressed against his throat, making it bulge like a snake throwing up an egg. I just kept beating him. I beat him until the white thing stopped moving, until I was covered in blood, until the shrieking died down, until the fingers stopped twitching in different directions, and until the head stopped swiveling back and forth. I beat him until my muscles burned and my breathing turned rapid from exhaustion. When I finally wiped the salt from my eyes, I was looking at nothing but broken bone and a yellow scarf. I barely remember making my way back to the main road. I remember collapsing as the sun rose and a man in a pickup truck calling for help. I remember a familiar face, a white door, something blue. Later on, my friend drove down from Morgantown to see me, and I got a dozen calls from my friends and family asking if I was okay. They also had me take a drug test. Apparently, I acted irrationally. So, just be careful. They can easily be identified. They wear something to cover their necks, and they travel one by one. They use something to get our attention or to separate us from others. Stop signs to catch lonely drivers, bus stop signs to get drifters. They probably have a dozen other similar tactics. I think they're learning about us with second-hand information, 
testing and prodding to see what works. They don't talk, and they can be very patient. That first one stayed with me for a long time before he attacked. Maybe he was just making sure I was alone. Looking back at it, I can barely even believe it happened. Have you ever had that one day that is just so different from anything else you've ever done? That one day that just feels like another life, another time? That was one of those days. Sometimes I even managed to convince myself that it was all a lie, a nightmare, something I cooked up in my sleep-deprived brain. But then, I look at that blue sunflower pin, the one that held the sleeve together, and I know. They're still out there. I'm an archaeologist, or rather, I'm an archaeology graduate. I completed my degree last year, and I've been trying to get onto a postgraduate course since then. It's a competitive field, with very few positions open. I narrowly missed my chance last summer, and I've been working in a bank while I apply for more positions. I studied at an English university, specialising in the Saxon settlement of Britain in the 6th century. Last month, one of my professors, who I'll call Sharon, emailed me. Somebody had found a possible new settlement. I won't say exactly where, but it's further west than any previously known Saxon village. She'd been excavating for some time and needed help with the work. I was wary of leaving the bank at such short notice, but when she hinted that additional funding for the dig might lead to a postgrad position opening up, I stopped caring about my reference from the bank. So, the next morning, I was on a train with little more than warm clothes, a sleeping bag and a laptop. By lunchtime, I arrived at the station and Sharon picked me up and we headed out to the site. England is very heavily developed and you're never more than a few kilometres from at least a small village. So the fact that we drove off-road in a jeep for nearly half an hour was quite remarkable. Apparently some scouts had been on a hiking trip and found a mostly buried wall. This sort of thing must happen all the time, but this time they had mentioned it to their scoutmaster, who was a historian and took an interest, eventually leading to the university getting involved. By the time I got there, the excavation had been going on for a while. The outlines of several buildings were visible, and I estimated the settlement would have housed around 30 people. Sharon helped me set up my tent, and then gave me a tour of the site. There were five of us at the site in total. I had no specific job, but I suspected I was mainly going to be doing the physical work. Sharon had 20 years of experience on me, and as the site lead would be responsible for writing reports, the university was going through an efficiency drive and she had to submit daily reports that justify the expense of the dig. Mark and Penny were undergrads, and Justin was an 18-year-old taking a gap year. So, as the second most senior person there, I was also in charge of documentation. We were a very young group, and only Sharon and I were taking any remuneration for the work. If we proved the site worthy of additional funding before Justin, Penny and Mark had to go home, no doubt more experienced archaeologists would take their place. So, I was very conscious that I had limited time to prove myself. This was October, and by the time I had set myself up, the light was fading fast. But keen to get to grips with the site, I spent the last hour of daylight studying the layout, sketching and making measurements. Given my knowledge of similar settlements, I made some predictions regarding the extent of the site and where we might find further buildings. Judging from the rest of the architecture, I figured the settlement might be post-Christian and estimated possible locations for a church. I spent the next two days looking for the church. Given the lack of funding, we had very limited equipment, but I'd been right about the location. 
On the third day, I uncovered part of a stone wall, a strong indicator of a church, and got Justin and Penny to help me uncover the shape. It was two days later that I found it. Justin was off helping Sharon and Mark was taking lunch, so I was working on my own, uncovering the floor of the church. As I slowly scraped the soil with my towel, I saw a hint of orange. I pulled out my brush and carefully cleaned the area to find what looked like an orange thread buried in the ground at both ends. This concerned me, although at the time not for the right reasons. Orange thread was far from anything I associated with the Saxons. I called Penny over as I knew she had an interest in Saxon textiles. She agreed that this was unlike anything she'd seen before. Most likely, the site had been contaminated recently, but we couldn't be sure, so Penny and I brushed the area to reveal more. After an hour, we had uncovered a network of threads about half a meter across. They ran through the ground in an organic pattern, like fungal mycelia, one thread had been uncovered sufficiently for Penny to put her finger underneath and lift it up. Before I could stop her, the thread snapped. It quickly turned to dust, causing my nose to itch and Penny to sneeze. I reprimanded her for her carelessness, and then we agreed to cover it up. It was early evening, and I didn't want moisture to affect the area. Our limited budget hadn't given us an excavation shelter, so we just put a sheet of polythene over the area and weighed it down with stones. Sharon knew no more than we did about the likely provenance of the orange threads. She took some photos and told us to leave it undisturbed until some of her colleagues had a chance to review it. And with the sun setting and Sharon typing up a daily report, the rest of us had a couple of beers and settled in to sleep. I awoke around 6 the next morning to the sound of car engines. Pulling on my shoes, I crawled out of the tent. Sharon and Mark were already up, watching four black SUVs pull up and park next to the camp. A man in a crisp black suit stepped out of the lead car and demanded curtly to speak to the project lead. He and Sharon walked off and began talking. I couldn't make out much, but I did hear Sharon raise her voice in argument a few times. The others were out of their tents now, and we spent about 15 minutes in wild conjecture until Sharon and the suit walked back. Sharon told us that the project was over, and we needed to pack our tents and leave immediately. Of course, we argued. This dig could make my career. And besides, Penny and I were very keen to learn more about the orange threads. There was no way these interlopers had the slightest clue about archaeology and would no doubt ruin the site if left alone with it. But in half an hour, we packed our things and we were in our cars. During the whole time, nobody stepped foot out of the black SUVs. We left and Sharon gave me a lift back home. I was in a dark mood that evening. I hadn't pleased my line manager at the bank when I'd quit without notice, so doubted they'd take me back, and it looked like my chance for a PhD was gone. But in the morning, as I settled down to search for jobs, I got a phone call. Sharon wanted the five of us to continue working. We may have been kicked off the dig site, but they couldn't stop us reviewing what we'd found so far. So, on Monday, I met Sharon, Mark and Penny in a cafeteria at the university. Justin had apparently made other plans. Between sketches, measurements, notes and photographs, we had actually gathered quite a lot of data, and it would likely take a couple of weeks to review it all. Sharon worked with Penny on mapping out the site in detail, and I worked with Mark on a literature review of comparable sites. But as the day wore on, I started to feel unaccountably wary of Mark. 
I'd gotten on with him very well at the site, but now he felt off somehow. The more I looked at him, the more I felt uncomfortable, as though being in the same room was dangerous, though I couldn't quite put my finger on it. The next day didn't ease my feelings. Something just seemed wrong. Not the creepy guy vibe I got off some men, but more of a sense that he was planning something nefarious. I confided in Penny over a coffee at lunch, and she confessed that she had gotten a similar feeling from Sharon. By Wednesday, I was feeling a little under the weather, but able to go in. When the four of us met, Mark asked if I was okay. I wouldn't normally remark on this, but the way Mark said it felt very accusatory. Sharon said I should work from home. I glanced at Penny, who just shrugged. Were Mark and Sharon planning something? To be honest, Mark and Sharon looked worse than I felt. Pale, perhaps, and their posture seemed vaguely threatening. I didn't want to leave them unsupervised and insisted that I was fine to continue. Before settling down to work, I managed to catch Penny alone at the coffee machine. Do I look okay to you? I opened. Yeah, a bit tired maybe. I don't know. I thought they were out of order back there. I don't trust them. Can you keep an eye on Sharon? Sure. Actually, I was going to say the same to you. See if Mark's acting weird. We can catch up at lunch. I found Mark in the spare office we were using, with the papers already out. As we got to work, I stood at Mark, noting his expression and posture. Again, it was subtle, but there was definitely something not right. I caught his dark brown eyes, and for an instant, they seemed to flash orange. Then, suddenly, he exploded. What? What do you mean? I replied calmly. You've been staring at me all morning. Have you got something to say? No, I... What could I say? I just... Look, if you want to ask me out, just come out and say it. I was astonished. What did he think was going on? I, uh... I had no idea what to do. Um, we should just... I looked down at my papers... I started to collate the citations, but had barely listed them all when Mark said he was going to lunch. It couldn't have been 10 o'clock yet, but when I looked, it was half past 12. I glanced at Mark's work, and he'd done at least three hours worth of work. I'd felt a bit unwell, sure, but how had I lost two hours? Mark got up and left. I could have carried on, but... Penny had agreed to meet for lunch, so I headed down to the cafeteria to find her sat down by herself. I grabbed a sandwich and water and joined her. So... Penny started in a low, conspiratorial voice. Anything to report? I recounted the outburst, the strange conversation, the odd body language. I almost didn't mention the flash of orange I'd seen, or thought I'd seen in Mark's eyes. But when I did, Penny gasped. I saw that too. In Mark? No, in Sharon. Wow, okay, that's weird. Any ideas? Well, I wasn't going to say it. I thought it was my imagination, but... Penny leaned in closely and lowered her voice even more. You remember the threads we found at the dig? Of course, they... Suddenly, I realized what she meant. They were the same orange, weren't they? What does it mean? I don't know, I replied. But I've got an idea. Let's meet at five. No, I don't feel good staying here with Sharon. Tell her you decided to go home after all, and I'll make up some excuse. Why don't we meet in my halls of residence? It's only ten minutes from here. So, Penny and I left the department early. Penny had a single room in a halls of residence, even smaller than my old one, and we cleared as much space as we could on a tiny desk. She offered me a coffee, but I didn't feel like one, and neither did she. 
The coffee that morning had tasted very bitter. So, with a glass of water each and some notebooks, we started writing everything we knew. What's cordyceps? Penny had glanced over at my notes before I was ready to compare. I explained what I knew. It's a fungus. It infects ants and controls their brain. It takes them somewhere more suitable for the fungus to grow and slowly eats them, converting their body into more of itself. Penny looked disgusted for a moment and then realized what I was getting at. The orange threads from the dig site that were mostly like mycelia. Had they infected Sharon and Mark? Penny opened her laptop and googled it. I'd got a few things wrong, but the basic principle was correct. Do you think that's what it was? Well, no. They only infect ants, but something like it. Something that can control humans would have to be more complex, I suppose. Well, we both saw the orange in their eyes. The eyes are close to your brain. I guess it would explain their weird behavior, right? We talked about this for a long time, bouncing theories off each other. Something that could infect the complex brain of a human. Well, it would have to be more sophisticated. The government agents that had closed down our dig site had arrived so quickly. They must have already known about the fungus, but not about that site. So there must be other sites. Could they be linked together, operating as a neural network across the country, even across the planet? An intelligent fungus, infecting hosts to achieve whatever their aims might be. We realized that the agents had arrived too late. I don't know why they didn't quarantine us, but we had no way of contacting them. We could have asked Sharon, but if she was far enough gone, she wouldn't help us. We had to do something ourselves. I don't remember whether it was myself or Penny who first said it, but we reluctantly agreed that it was our only option. We had to stop the infection from spreading. We sat up late into the night, planning our next steps, and I slept on Penny's floor. I'd gone home sick that day, so I would pretend to be ill and collect the equipment we needed, except for the car. Penny texted her brother, asking to borrow his, saying she needed it for a university project. The next morning, Penny went into the department. I tried to persuade her not to but she insisted that somebody needed to keep an eye on the disease's progression. She was right, of course. I spent the day gathering supplies. It would have been easier to wait for the car, but we had to move fast. I met Penny that afternoon, somewhat relieved that she was okay, and her brother dropped the car off. He wanted to stay and enjoy the university life for a night, but we had work to do, so Penny made some half-hearted excuse and he took the last train home. We checked our equipment, went over the plan again, and for a second night, I slept on Penny's floor. The next day, we went to the university. I walked while Penny drove, so that we didn't arrive together and arouse suspicion. That morning was one of the most difficult few hours of my life, pretending to Mark that everything was normal. He looked different, twisted somehow, though nobody but Penny and I seemed to notice. Sharon was the same. We took Sharon and Mark out for lunch. We told them that we were so happy to be part of this project that we wanted to repay them. Our treat, we said. Sharon protested, saying it should be her to pay for all of us, but eventually they agreed. I normally like Mexican food, but it tasted strangely sour, as though the ingredients had gone off somehow. But we weren't there for the pleasure. Our plan was risky, but it worked. I won't explain what the drug was, or how I obtained it, but I managed to slip it into Sharon and Mark's food without them noticing. We kept them there, celebrating for an hour or so, long enough for the drug to take effect. By this time, Sharon and Mark were feeling ill, and Penny offered to drive them back to the department. She had left her car in the restaurant's car park, and we helped them into the back seat. 
I got into the passenger seat and Penny started to drive. Of course, we weren't going back to the university. We drove about half an hour out of town to an area of scrubland, far from any houses, and drove out of sight of the main road. Penny feigned concern and suggested to Sharon and Mark that they might want to get some fresh air. Eventually they agreed and we helped them out of the car. We then went back to the car, collecting the two hammers I'd bought the previous day. Drugged as they were, we still needed to take them by surprise. I struck Mark three times in the head and Penny hit Sharon twice. That was enough to stop them moving. I don't know for sure if they were dead at this point, but we were sure there was no coming back from that. Penny covered the back seats with plastic sheeting while I did my best to make sure their injuries weren't obvious. Then we put them back in the car. Penny drove for four hours while I navigated, and as the night started to fall, we arrived back at that cursed dig site. We had expected this to be the most difficult part of our plan, but the agents were nowhere to be seen. I have no idea why not. For all their apparent aggressiveness, did they not realize precisely what they were dealing with? The alternative, that they themselves had become infected, was too terrible to contemplate. Still, it made our task far easier. We parked as close as we could and dragged the bodies the remaining 50 meters to lay them in the ruined church. If they were infected, then so was the ground, and we could at least contain the infection. So, it was likely that nobody would encounter the bodies for months, or perhaps years to come. And so, we left Sharon and Mark to rot in the infected soil, and drove back. It was four in the morning when we arrived, and we went back to Penny's room. Our task was done, or so we thought. We celebrated with a bottle of wine, but the wine had gone sour, so we abandoned it and went with water instead. At that point, it was Saturday morning. Neither of us were feeling great, and we spent most of the weekend in Penny's small bed watching Netflix. We decided to go in on the Monday morning so as to not arouse suspicion and continue working on the archaeological write-up. Over the course of that day, we realized that we acted too late. Other people in the department had strange expressions or orange-tinted veins in their eyes. We went out for lunch, having a salad and water, and our server looked infected as well. I don't understand why Penny and I are the only ones who can see it. Our task is clear though. We've done it before, and we can do it again. We must do it again. We must cleanse the world of this fungus, killing the infected and taking their bodies to the ancient Saxon church, before it spreads beyond our control. If it hasn't already... I've never told anyone what happened to me when I was 14, but I guess I kind of always wanted to. My name is Max, I'm 25 now, so this is a bit of ancient history I suppose. My grandfather passed away when I was 14, and my mother was his only child. He was divorced from my grandma and had never remarried or anything, so all the stuff you have to do when someone dies fell to my mom. He lived a few states away, so one weekend we went out to his house so mom could go through everything and see if there was anything she or I wanted to keep before the estate sale. His house was pretty cool really. He had acres of land and there was a pond and he had an in-ground pool and the house wasn't like a mansion or anything, but it was way more than one old guy needed. Grandpa Ray had grown up super poor. His father was an alcoholic who couldn't hold a job and was abusive to his kids. Grandpa had a brother and sister, 
both of whom passed before he did. Grandpa vowed to never be like his father, so he stayed away from alcohol, and he worked really hard getting a doctorate and becoming a college professor and building a really nice life. Oh my gosh, I tend to ramble. Let me get to Lemon Belly. So, we drive to his house one Friday and get there late. So, we just crash. Saturday morning, we start going through the house, both of us picking things to keep. I find the attic and head up. It was a total jackpot. First of all, there's a box full of Playboys from like the 70s and 80s. I spent a fair amount of the early morning flipping through some of those. There were some really cool clothes, some old toys, just kind of neat stuff. And then, I come across the chest, pushed back into the corner and covered with an old blanket. It's locked. But, after searching some more, I find a key hanging on a rusty nail on the other side of the attic. It opens the chest. There's a little bit of disappointment at first. The chest was mostly filled with old newspapers and some manila envelopes with stuff like the house deeds and my mum's birth certificate and all that. But, at the bottom of the box, tucked into the corner was a small velvet bag. I took it and untied a stiff bit of string from around the opening. I tilted the bag out and Lemon Belly fell into my hand. Okay, so I know right now none of you know who Lemon Belly is, but I'm going to tell this story the right way. I didn't know who he was at the time either. Inside the bag had been a bottle maybe half the size of one of those old glass coke bottles. It was glass too, stopped with a cork that looked as though it might crumble into dust as soon as it was touched. Inside the bottle was a dark amber liquid, too dense to see through. I turned the bottle in my hand and felt it shift. There was something floating within the dark liquid. I turned the bottle another way and there was a tiny thump as a yellow ball slid through the liquid and came to rest against the glass. I mean, I thought it was a ball at first. I could only really make out half the ball. The liquid inside the bottle was so dark. There was another bit of string wrapped around the neck of the bottle and a small tag attached to it. On one side of the tag, what I assumed at the time was Latin, and I was correct was Nulla Domus Hic. On the other side of the tag was English. Lemon Belly, it said in blocky red letters, written in a shaky hand, and underneath, never open. Obviously, my teenage curiosity had my fingers in that cork in a heartbeat. I would have pulled it open right then, and who knows how this story would have gone. But I heard my mother calling me. I set the bottle on a nearby shelf and hurried down to see what she needed. And then my mom kept me busy with this and that for the rest of the day. And I kind of forgot about the bottle. To be quite honest, it was the magazines that sent me back up to the attic on Sunday, just before we left. I stashed a few in my duffel bag. And then, as I was turning, I saw the bottle and hurried over to it and dropped it in my bag as well. I didn't empty my bag for another week or so. School was kind of going rough, if I can be quite honest. I was a chubby kid and there was these three friends that gave me a lot of crap. That week, I also started having really bad dreams, like weird nightmares that I couldn't even remember the next day. But they would have me waking up in a cold sweat or even yelling out once or twice. My blanket on the floor and my bed sheet twisted and wrapped around me. When I did get into the bag, it was to stash the magazines in my closet. I pulled the bottle out and set it on my nightstand. I would have maybe opened it again, but I remember wondering what exactly that gross looking liquid was 
and what the yellow ball could be, and I started to worry it would poison me or something. Maybe it would just be cooler to hang on to it and keep it on my table or shelf. A month or so after I found the bottle, I had a dream that I did remember. It sticks with me now. I can recall every last bit of it, as though it had just happened last night. I was standing in a strange room made of giant stones stacked upon one another. Behind me was an opening to what looked to be a desert. It was night and I could hear the wind blowing. Before me, a raised dais with a throne of sorts. Sitting on the throne, a figure wearing a long cloak, a hood up to conceal his face. Tell me, young one, what do you desire? The cloaked figure asked me, his voice raspy and low. The bullying at school had only gotten worse. Joey, James and Chris won't leave me alone. I want them to stop, I said in the dream, stepping forward. You must free me then, the cloaked figure said. As he spoke, he stood, and the cloak fell away. The figure was much taller than the average man, at least eight feet, and was completely nude. Its skin was a sickly pale yellow, except for its jutting belly, which darkened to a lemony color. Its face was hideous, folds of fat that jiggled as it grinned, its teeth sharp and its eyes small and black. It held a hand out to me, its fingers long and ending in curved nails that looked as though they could cut through flesh as easily as a knife through butter. Free me. Yes, I said in the dream. I bowed low, and then I woke. I was standing in my room, holding something in my hand. I looked down, my eyes taking a moment to adjust to the dark. I held the bottle in my hand and felt a shock of fear roll through my system. I was looking at that yellow ball and realized it wasn't a ball at all. It was a belly, great and distended and yellow. Beyond the belly, no doubt, the rest of Lemon Belly, the liquid too dark to reveal him. Lemon Belly, I remember saying out loud. I had two fingers on the cork. I pulled. I... I expected something, but nothing happened. I let the cork fall to the ground. I held the bottle up. I could not feel the movement of an object inside the way I once had. I shook it a bit, but it wouldn't appear. Lemon Belly was gone. Somehow, I fell back asleep that night. I dreamed again. I was standing now in a stranger's living room. The front door behind me opened slowly and I turned. Lemon Belly was there, one hand on the knob, ducking to get his ugly head under the door frame. You should see this, he said, looking right at me. A cold chill spread in my chest as I was overcome with fear. Was this a dream? It had to be. The whole damn thing had to be a dream, I thought at the time. Lemon Belly stepped past me in that dream, and I pressed myself back against the wall in an effort to give him as much birth as I could. Come, he said over his shoulder, and in the dream, I was helpless to do anything other than follow. Lemon Belly moved so strangely. His movements jerky and unwieldy. He went up the stairs and I still followed. It was like he knew exactly where he was going. He moved down the upstairs hall to a door that was closed to the crack. Unease and dread washed over me as the yellow monster pushed the door open and stepped inside. In my dream, 
I was willing myself not to follow, but my feet paid no attention to my brain, and into the room I went. It was Joey's room, the leader of the three boys who bullied me. I saw him asleep in his bed. He was tall and athletic, and his two stooges did whatever he told them to. He had been picking on me for years. I was torn, watching Lemon Belly move to his bedside. I didn't know what the creature was going to do, but I knew it wasn't going to be good. At the same time, I kind of wanted it. I wanted Joey to be punished. I wanted him to be hurt. Lemon Belly looked back at me, his pinprick eyes glowing in the soft light of the silver moon. Then he turned to Joey and opened his mouth. His jaw fell almost to his chest and then kept going. It dropped and dropped and dropped. And soon his mouth was a massive black moor ringed in sharp teeth. No, I cried out in a dream. But Lemon Belly did not stop. He reached for Joey, grabbed the boy with frightening speed and was shoving him into his mouth before he had a chance to wake up fully. I could hear him scream as Lemon Belly's lips came together, his mouth normal again. He was screaming from that gorged yellow stomach, screaming for help. I woke with a start. It was dark still, and when I looked at my phone, it was four in the morning. I slept no more that night. The next morning, Joey wasn't at school. That afternoon, our grade was called into the gym. We sat in the bleachers, and our principal told us that Joey was missing. He asked anyone for any information they might have. I kept my hand down. When I got home, I checked the bottle. Lemon Belly was still missing. I went to the bathroom, intending to pour the liquid down the drain. But something stopped me. I don't know why, but I just couldn't go through with my plan. I corked the bottle back up. That night, I had another dream. I watched Lemon Belly enter James's house and eat him as well. I was powerless to stop him. I didn't even try. I was worried he would eat me if I did. The next day, I feigned being sick so I could stay home from school. Around noon, one of my friends texted me to tell me they had another assembly, and this time it was James going missing. Apparently, the police were there this time, asking questions of his friends. Everyone seemed to think maybe the two boys had ran away. I was the only one who knew the truth. I also knew that stopping Lemon Belly was going to fall to me. I couldn't go to anyone, not my mother, not the police. What would I tell them? I had to figure something out. I stared at the bottle for a long time. Then, finally, a possible answer came to me. I looked at the tag and translated the Latin. It came out roughly to, There is no home here. I had an idea. A wild one, but I had to try. That night, I snuck out of my home. I climbed out of my window. Thankful that my room was on the ground floor. I considered getting my bike from the garage, but I didn't want to risk lifting the door and waking my mother, so I had to go on foot, and I was worried I'd be too late. I ran for Chris's house, knowing that I would find Lemon Belly there. He lived nearby, thank God, but my heart dropped when I got to his house and saw that the front door was standing open. I stepped inside and shut the door behind me. I considered yelling out and waking Chris's parents, but I didn't know what they would say. If he was already gone, how would it look for me to be there?
in their home. A creak from the floor overhead. I'd never been here, but it was easy enough to find the stairs. I moved up then quickly, just in time to see Lemon Belly disappear through a doorway. I followed him. He sensed me, turning as he crouched over Chris's bed. Leave me, he snarled, but I shook my head. I tried to reply, but my mouth had gone dry, and the words I attempted died in my throat. I jammed my hand into my jacket pocket and pulled out the bottle. If Lemon Belly was scared, he didn't show it, but he did take a step toward me, reaching one long hand in my direction. I uncorked the bottle and held it in front of me. Now, Lemon Belly paused, glancing down at the bottle and then back to my face. Suddenly, he lunged forward and I leapt back, barely keeping the bottle upright and barely keeping out of range of his swiping claw. I slammed back into the wall in the hallway and turned and ran. Lemon Belly followed. I could hear him lumbering down the stairs, hot on my heels. I flew out the front door and into the street, turning to see Lemon Belly still chasing me. I will not be imprisoned again, Lemon Belly snarled. You will, I told him, holding the bottle forward. I said the Latin words. Lemon Belly roared and the bottle grew hot in my hand, so hot that I almost dropped it. There was a flash of bright light and then a popping sound and Lemon Belly was gone. The weight of the bottle in my hand was different, and I slammed the cork home. I held the bottle up and used the light from the street lamp to confirm that the yellow stomach was there, pressed against the glass when I held the bottle a certain way. Through the liquid came one long hand, pressed against the glass as well. I shivered. And that was that. I learned that night just what my grandfather had come to possess. Ultimate power. I would be lying if I said I never let Lemon Belly out again. There was a time in college when my girlfriend left me for another guy. He had to go. And so did she when she didn't come back to me. That guy who got that promotion over me a few years ago. He didn't deserve to live, did he? It's easy letting Lemon Belly free and then going and collecting him. He almost doesn't even fight me anymore. He never turns on me, never comes for me until I come for him. Maybe he's not allowed. I sense some sort of weird rules are at play here. Now that I think about it, he's never tried to hurt me. He always seems to be going for the bottle. All I know is it's nice to be the one in power. My name is Alex, and for the past eight years, I've been a 911 dispatcher. I work tirelessly in a dimly lit room filled with glowing screens, buzzing equipment, and low chatter. Nearly every day I sit at my station wearing a headset that connects me to the voices of those in need. Working as a dispatcher has changed me though. After handling countless emergency calls, you develop a certain level of emotional resilience. You have to. There's no room for panic or hesitation when someone's life is on the line. I've heard the fear in people's voices, the desperation, the terror. I've listened to their last words, sent help racing to the location, and done everything in my power to keep them calm until help arrives. It's a heavy burden to bear, but I wouldn't trade it for anything. Still though, it can get to you, leave you in a dour mindset at the end of a night Nights spent drinking to forget some of the more unforgiving circumstances 
that you endure through the night. Life at the call centre has become a sort of second home for me. I form close bonds with my fellow dispatchers, sharing stories, laughter and tears during our long shifts together. We've become a tight-knit family, supporting each other through the emotional highs and lows that come with a job. It's a demanding career, one that often leaves me feeling physically and emotionally drained at the end of a shift. But as I lay my head down to rest each night, I find solace in the knowledge that I've made a difference in the lives of those who needed me most. Sometimes it feels like a thankless job, one where I just tether the right people to whoever's in trouble. But at times, I get to be the voice that stays on the line during a traumatic moment which spurs me on. I remember it was a cold, rainy night in October when I received the strangest call of my career. My shift had started as usual. It was a weekday, so the first few hours had been relatively quiet. I just settled in with a fresh cup of coffee, and the phone rang. Glancing at the caller ID, I was confused that it was coming from my own number. I tapped my phone, which was face up on my desk to see it was idle on the lock screen. No pocket dial going out, despite it being impossible anyway. So, I hesitated for a moment before answering the call. As I picked up the call, my mind raced with thoughts of why that would happen. Maybe it was a similar number off by one digit that I'd misread at a glance, or a simple mistake on the system. Either way, my mouth autopiloted the opening words that I'd said a thousand times over. 911, what is your emergency? The voice on the other end of the line was unmistakably mine, which sent a chill down my spine. It was full of fear and panic. Alex, I need you to listen to me. I don't have much time. There's going to be an accident on the corner of Oak and Elm in 10 minutes. You have to warn the authorities and get them there before it happens. Lives are at stake. I was dumbfounded. The voice sounded so much like my own that it was impossible to believe it could be anyone else. As the fear in the voice gripped me, I felt my own fear rising. I knew I couldn't afford to let it cloud my judgement though. Maintaining composure was a core part of the job. Who is this? I asked hesitantly. Just trust me Alex, the voice implored. You'll understand later. Please, just send help to Oak and Elm. You can prevent a tragedy. Before I could respond, the line went dead. I stared at the phone, my hands shaking, and my thoughts a whirlwind of confusion and fear. My instincts as a dispatcher urged me to treat the call as legitimate, but part of me couldn't help but question the bizarre circumstances. With a deep breath, I decided to trust the voice and dispatched emergency services to the intersection. As I did, I couldn't shake the feeling of discomfort. It only just hit me that he knew my name, adding more to the pile of mysteries. I anxiously awaited an update from the responders, hoping beyond hope that I had made the right choice. When the radio crackled to life, confirming that a major accident had indeed occurred at the exact location and time the voice had predicted, my heart dropped. I was flooded with relief that I had taken the warning seriously, but at the same time, a sense of dread gnawed at me. If the voice had been right about the accident, what else did it know? Just as I was beginning to process the implications of the first call, the phone rang again. My heart leapt into my throat as I saw my own number displayed once more. The fear and anxiety that had been building within me threatened to overtake me, but I knew that I couldn't let it. I'd been witness to so many traumatic calls that I had a strong resolve. 
and I pulled on that experience to push me to do my job, despite the horrendously terrifying situation. With a trembling hand, I picked up the call, praying for answers and stealing myself for whatever came next. Alex, the voice urgently whispered, I know you're scared and I know this is difficult to believe, but you have to trust me. There's a woman named Sarah who will call you in exactly three minutes. Her abusive ex-boyfriend is trying to break into her apartment. She'll be hiding in the closet. Tell her to stay quiet and send the police to her address immediately. As I listened to the voice, my emotions were a swirling tempest of disbelief and concern. I was terrified by the unexplainable connection I seemed to share with this caller. But at the same time, I couldn't ignore the fact that if the first call was legitimate, then there were potential lives at stake. I felt an immense pressure to make the right decision. Who are you? I asked again, my voice wavering. How do you know all this? I can't explain everything right now, but I promise you'll understand soon, the voice replied, a hint of desperation creeping in, almost matching my own. Please. Just trust me. Once again, the line went dead, leaving me with nothing but my racing thoughts and the dull hum of the call center around me. As the seconds ticked by, I felt a growing sense of unease, the tension in the room almost palpable. I glanced around at my colleagues, wondering if they were having a similar experience as me. After the longest three minutes of my life, just as the voice had predicted, Sarah's call came through. Her panicked voice echoed in my ear, and I knew that I couldn't ignore the warning I'd been given. I guided Sarah through the terrifying ordeal, keeping her calm as I dispatched the police to her location. All the while, my own emotions threatened to bubble to the surface, a strange sense of connection to this woman I'd never met. When I received the confirmation that Sarah had been safely rescued and her ex-boyfriend apprehended, a wave of relief washed over me. But that relief was short-lived, as the weight of the situation continued to bear down on me. The voice on the phone had known these events would happen, and I couldn't shake the feeling that there was more to come. It wasn't long before the third call came. My heart was leaping as my own number appeared on the screen once more. I hesitated for a moment, my hand hovering over the phone. I felt a deep sense of dread which screamed at me to tear my hand away. But I couldn't ignore the call, not when lives were potentially on the line. Swallowing hard, I picked up the receiver and braced myself for what was to come. Alex? Alex, the voice said, now sounding more urgent than ever. You need to leave the call center right now. There's a gas leak in the building. It's going to explode in less than five minutes. You have to get everyone out. My blood ran cold as the gravity of the situation hit me like a ton of bricks. Everything that had been building within me throughout the night threatened to overwhelm me. But I knew I couldn't let it. I had to act quick. How do you know this? I demanded, my voice trembling. Who are you? The voice, now frantic, replied. Don't freak out, Alex. There isn't time. I'm you. I'm calling from the future. I know this is hard to believe, but you have to trust me. There's no time to explain. You need to evacuate the building right now. My mind raised as I tried to process what I was hearing. Was it really possible that I was speaking to myself from the future? The notion seemed too surreal to be true, yet the evidence was impossible to ignore. I had to make a decision, and I had to make it quickly. Feeling the weight of responsibility bearing down on me, I made my choice. I slammed down the receiver and jumped to my feet, my heart pounding as I rushed to alert my colleagues. With a frantic and confused evacuation, hailed by constant questions from everyone moving past me, 
I was too deep in thought to explain anything to them. Many protested, knowing how important the job was, and to leave the centre was a huge endangerment to the people in need. But I just layered on the urgency until they too left. We barely made it out in time. As we watched from a safe distance, the building was engulfed in flames, the explosion shaking the very ground beneath our feet. I stood there, my fellow dispatchers huddled around me, their faces etched with shock and relief. As the reality of what had just happened began to sink in, I found myself grappling with a whirlwind of emotions. Relief that we had all escaped unharmed, gratitude to the voice that had warned me, and a lingering sense of disbelief that I had truly been communicating with my future self. When asked how I knew what was going to happen, I gave some half-hearted response about smelling something, but most people were too much in shock to probe further than that. But, amidst the chaos and confusion, one thing became clear. I have been given a gift, a chance to change the course of my life and the lives of those around me. And I knew I couldn't let that gift go to waste. In the days that followed the explosion, I found myself consumed by the events that had transpired. The voice on the phone, my own voice, had saved countless lives, including my own. And although I struggled to wrap my head around the concept of communicating with my future self, I couldn't deny the reality of what had happened. As I tried to come to terms with the situation, I realized that the knowledge I'd gained could be both a blessing and a curse. I was suddenly faced with the daunting responsibility of this secret knowledge, and I couldn't shake the feeling that every decision I made could have life-altering consequences. The weight of that responsibility felt like an immense burden. But I couldn't let my fear hold me back. I knew that I potentially had a unique opportunity to make a difference, to help those who needed it most. And so, with each passing day, I found myself more determined than ever to trust the voice and see if I can use these calls for good. A nearby building was rented and very quickly set up to take dispatcher calls. It was a necessity, so no expense was spared in getting the setup expedited. I dove headfirst into my work, answering calls with a renewed sense of purpose and urgency. I kept a close eye on the caller ID, always anticipating the next mysterious call from my future self. And when those calls came, I heeded their warnings without hesitation, trusting my own voice to guide me. I found myself constantly on edge. I felt a deep sense of loneliness knowing that I couldn't share my secret with anyone, not even my closest colleagues. As the days turned into weeks, I began to see the impact of my actions. Lives were saved, tragedies averted, and hope restored. And with each success, I felt my confidence growing, my fears slowly giving way to a sense of pride and accomplishment. I knew that I was walking a fine line, playing with forces that I couldn't fully understand. But in my heart, I believed that I was doing the right thing. No one suspected anything. Often, the dispatcher is simply the bridge between the caller and the services. So, it was easy to think that it was a coincidence that I had simply been the one to pick up the phone. As I continued to heed the warnings from my stranger self, I came to understand that the greatest power I possessed wasn't the ability to predict the future or change the course of events. Rather, it was the power of choice, the choice to trust an urgent voice, to embrace the unknown. One night, as I sat at my station, the phone rang once again, this time displaying an unknown number. I read it in anticipation as I picked up the receiver. The voice on the other end was familiar, but off as if it wasn't quite human. Alex, the voice growled. 
You've grown complacent. There's a terrible future ahead of you. I've seen it, and you must prevent it. Dread washed over me, my mind racing as I tried to figure what was happening this time. Was this another version of myself? I listened cautiously as the voice continued. Over the course of several calls, the voice provided cryptic warnings and riddles, each one hinting at a potential disaster or tragedy that I needed to avert. At first, the instructions seemed relatively benign. In the first call, the voice told me about an argument that was about to take place between two of my close friends, which would lead to the end of their friendship. It gave me the exact time and location to intervene and mediate the conflict. I hesitantly followed the instructions, and to my surprise, I managed to prevent the fallout between them. The second call, the voice directed me to leave an anonymous tip to the police about an elderly neighbor who was at risk of a gas leak in her home. The voice claimed that if I didn't act, she would suffer a terrible accident. I wrestled with the decision, but eventually decided to make the call. The next day, I found out that the police had indeed discovered a gas leak in her home and had it repaired just in time. As the calls continued, the voice's aggression and demands began to escalate. It instructed me to break into a co-worker's home to find evidence of a conspiracy plot, convincing me that the co-worker was planning something malicious that would affect many people. Reluctantly, I obliged, only to find seemingly inconclusive evidence, which made me question my actions and the tips I was getting. The next call pushed me further urging me to sabotage the brakes of a car to prevent an accident that would lead to a catastrophic chain reaction. Each instruction was darker than the last, leaving me increasingly lost compared to the first Alex that was calling me. Still though, there was a chance that I was still doing good. The glimmer of hope sparked by the many calls still stuck in my heart Fearing the consequences of not heeding the warnings, I began to follow the voice's instructions to the letter, even when they involved morally questionable actions. As I did, I found my relationships with friends, family and co-workers deteriorate, leaving me isolated and paranoid. As I continued to follow the voice's instructions, a nagging doubt started to grow in the back of my mind. I couldn't help but question whether the voice was genuinely another version of myself or something more sinister. The line between right and wrong had been blurred, and I struggled to make sense of the chaos that had enveloped my life. Feeling increasingly lost and desperate, I decided to do some research, hoping to find answers or any explanation for the bizarre events that had been occurring. I had to dredge through many hoaxes, crackpots with keyboards, and straight up otherworldly conspiracies. But during my search, I stumbled upon a concept called Tulpa, a sentient being created from the collective thoughts, beliefs, and energy of its creator. According to the information I found, a Tulpa can become powerful and independent, even capable of interacting with the physical world. The more I read, the more I became convinced that the voice on the phone was a tulpa I had inadvertently created. My loneliness and the emotional turmoil of working in the emergency dispatcher center had given birth to this entity, which had begun to take on a life of its own, something that had been masquerading as my future self all along. It had been using me as a pawn to create scenarios that brought suffering feeding on the emotional highs and lows it had caused. With this revelation, I knew I had to take control of the situation and reclaim my life. I understood that it fed on my fear, despair and loneliness, so I had to face my emotions and confront the entity head on. I waited for the next call. My anxiety was through the roof as I prepared to confront it though now for different reasons. When the phone rang, I answered it without hesitation, 
asserting my newfound determination. I know what you are, I told the voice firmly, and I won't let you control me any longer. It laughed, attempting to undermine my resolve. You think you can just get rid of me, Alex? I'm part of you, you know. I steadied my voice, focusing on staying strong. I created you, and I can unmake you. I won't let you hurt anyone else. I hung up and carried on through my shift with a forced composure. Realizing that I had to weaken it by depriving it of the negative emotions it fed upon, I began to reconnect with friends and family, rebuilding the relationships I had neglected while under this thing's influence. I sought professional help to cope with the emotional stress and loneliness I had experienced as a result of my job. Over time, the caller's power waned. The scenarios it called in were more and more mundane, until all it could conjure was a cat stuck in a tree. As I continued to cultivate positive connections and emotions, its voice grew weaker with each call as it became increasingly desperate to maintain its grip on me. I knew that I had to sever the connection completely to put an end to its existence. One night, I received the final call from my number. I faced it with a sense of calm and determination. This is the end, I told the voice firmly. I've taken back control of my life and you no longer have power over me. The Tulba's voice faded into a whisper, its existence flickering on the edge of oblivion. You can't do this. But I had already made my choice. Goodbye, I said, and hung up the phone for the last time. From then on, it was gone, banished from my life forever. I faced my inner demons come real and conquered them, emerging stronger and more resilient than before. The ordeal had taught me valuable lessons about the power of emotions and the importance of staying connected with the people I cared about. As I moved forward with my life, I carried the lessons I had learned with me, determined to use them to shape a brighter and more fulfilling future. I get shot at, a lot, but that isn't what scares me about this job. When I arrive at a home and see someone burst out of the front door clutching a rifle, I know what to expect. They have something to lose, they're scared and they don't know what to do. So I tell them, I give them resources and fighting back, I refer them to law firms who do pro bono work government bodies and charities that can help them get back on their feet. I speak calmly and with empathy, and people listen. Some even thank me as they pack their things up and drive away. People ending themselves are harder to deal with. I get at least three or four a year, and people who do it out of spite really go all out on the spectacle. The harder it is for the bank to clean up, the better, and people assume the bank puts their house on the market the second it's seized, but a house can sit forgotten for years before I'm sent to look it over. Lone bodies swinging in empty living rooms, flesh like melted candle wax from all that time left in open air. I find it profoundly sad. These people lay themselves out like a spiteful diorama and then no one turns up. They slit their throats while clutching eviction notices, and by the time I arrive, the blood is dried and the ink has faded. The worst ones don't just hurt themselves, but their loved ones too. Packs are more common with the elderly, but it isn't always octogenarians. Families too. It's rare, but it does happen. A sun-baked house with drawn curtains. So much time passed in dry autumn heat that their skin turned paper thin, 
receding lips, black, toothless gums born in a rictus grin. Hell of a thing to see staring out of a crib. Each house is its own apocalypse, its own ruined city for me to wonder. Whiskey in the toilet cistern, fentanyl under the bed, bills past due. And it doesn't just end with the people we kick out. These places are empty so long, you'll often get squatters. Usually harmless, not always. Some have the potential to be thoroughly lethal. Stringy men and women with flinty eyes and missing teeth who come bursting out of the multi blankets and indoor tents, slashing box cutters wildly in the air. You could play tic-tac-toe on my forearm from all the defensive wounds. Even when they're moved on, the things they leave behind aren't exactly safe. Fumes from homemade labs can rot your lungs, and disease-positive needles stuffed down the sides of old sofa cushions wait to prick curious fingers. And the cooks get real paranoid about being robbed, so they like to rig their homes with traps. They get inventive with whatever's lying around. Shards of glass on spring-loaded broom handles, trick floorboards over boxes of razor blades, infection-smeared knives hidden beneath false windowsills. Every now and again, I find a trap that's been set off. A baseball bat rigged to lash out at anyone entering the kitchen, blood and hair dripping from the bent nails hammered into the wood. No sign of the poor guy who set it off, just the grisly trail of gore leading out of the house and into the nearby woods. Most likely candidate is the guy who set the trap. These addicts can stay up for days and pass out, and when they wake up, the first thing they do is head for their stash, not remembering what they left behind. One time, I found the guy lying a few feet away from his own trap. He kept his money in this old, metal lunchbox at the back of a cupboard, and he'd rigged it so anyone reaching in would get a hell of a surprise. The blade went in at his elbow and left just below the knuckle on his thumb. No helping him after that. He died bleeding out on his late grandmother's cold linoleum. What a god-awful way to go. And his little lunchbox? On the ground and empty of everything worth taking. Police reckon someone was with him when it happened. Must have gotten scared, so they took the cash and left him to die. It'd take a full month before I found him, and no one even reported him missing in the interim. You'd think the kid would be angry, but he wasn't. He just looked like he was scared. Nineteen, going through withdrawal and dying slowly, curled up like a baby, one hand gripping his open wrist. You can't trap the ocean in your fist. It leaks through your fingers. That kid knew what was coming. I could see it in his eyes. Terrified. Meth is a hell of a drug. These poor guys fry their brains out in the middle of nowhere. I can't even begin to imagine what they think they see out there. What visits them in the dark. Found this trailer once that had been rigged with damn near a hundred traps. They weren't particularly sophisticated, but they were numerous and vicious and desperate. They circled the lone motorhome out in the middle of the desert like an invading army made of knives and bear traps and stolen guns and even a few hastily made IEDs. Took me and a bomb squad a week just to get to the front door and by the time we opened it, we were all fairly certain of one simple fact. This place hadn't been rigged to keep thieves out. Whoever had set the traps had been scared of something leaving. Probably just drug-fueled paranoia on behalf of whoever set them. But I think the idea that something was in there, waiting for us, got under our skin anyway. During the operation, we'd sometimes get shouted reports of someone moving around in the trailer, and the whole sight would go to hell. Armed men and women lying in their bellies, iron sights lined up on the front door, hands shaking. I guess we kept asking ourselves, over and over, What's in there that had someone so scared they set all these traps? 
when we finally got our answer. The first thing we found was a meth lab. Pretty par for the course. Less normal was a body that had been torn to pieces. Halfway to dust after all that time in that heat had passed. But it was strewn all over the interior. Walls, floor, ceiling. Couldn't argue it was a natural death or a product of scavengers. Not unless coyotes can work a lock and key. What was left of his head and torso looked like he'd gone through hell. I'm hardly a forensic expert, but it had looked to me like he died slowly and painfully. Missing fingers, teeth, one eye plucked out. Torture is what it made me think of. Even stranger than all of that though, was what we found sat on the kitchen counter next to all those broken beakers and stained chemistry equipment. A doll. Not like a kid's doll. Porcelain, like a collector's item that had seen better days. Scared the hell out of me, given the circumstances and all. Couldn't shake the feeling whoever had made all those traps had done so with that thing in mind. Which begged the question, who was the poor guy stuck inside the trailer and what had happened to him? Cops wrote it off. Meth is a hell of a drug, so they say. We all knew that. Only, I wasn't so sure. I've seen a lot of weird stuff. Who knows what visited that poor guy out in the wild, so far from civilization. A lot of life gets lived out in the world, out in the plains or in the forests, and amongst hills, far from prying eyes. You get a sense of it in my job. The sheer quantity of untold stories, failed dreams, great triumphs, abandoned canvases, well-worn guitars, heydays that came and went, or simply never came at all. Most stories follow a rhythm. Most. Some, like that doll, raise profound questions. Others aren't really stories at all, so much as nightmares just waiting for the next victim. This world is full of hidden needles waiting for probing hands. There are rare occasions where I'll advise the bank not to sell a property. They become part of a kind of no-go zone the government has set up around the country. I only see bits of this machinery at work. Whatever bureaucracy manages it is way over my pay grade, but there is a system in place for managing the worst of the worst. I'm not talking ghosts either. None of the examples I've given so far would be candidates. Sounds messed up, I know. Scrub the blood, scrape the brains, pick the shotgun pellets out of the plaster. If the next family who move in have to contend with the ghosts of a few clumsy methods or disgruntled former owners, well, so be it. No, for a place to be deemed a no-go, it has to be beyond recovery and an active threat to life. I'm talking factories with bottomless holes that pump out enough radiation the government has to build a nuclear dump site just to make a convincing cover. Although that is a bit of an extreme example, most of the time we just blame it on radon or meth fumes and condemn it. At this one place, a farmhouse where a family of five had lived for nearly 60 years. By the time I got there, the kids were adults and the parents had been dead for a while. The children had resisted selling the family home, tried to keep up with the payments, but they had their own debts and in the end, the bank got its pound of flesh. At a glance, the house didn't look too bad. A bit run down, sure. But my standards are low. Cracked in low. Windows were intact, no graffiti, roof hadn't been stripped, satellite dish was still up. From where I sat in my car, gulping down a lukewarm bottle of water that had spent the drive tumbling around the passenger footwell, the house was relatively untouched by anything except nature and time. Something about that gave me pause. 
Shame I didn't listen to the gut feeling telling me it was all sorts of weird that an isolated house had gone undecayed for so long. I grabbed the keys the sheriff had given me and went inside, hoping for an easy gig. Three hours later, and I was crawling out a kitchen window I'd smashed, the shirt and skin of my back cut to ribbons. I stumbled to my car, chest near bursting from the pounding of my heart and my eyes fixed on the empty window frame I'd just escaped. A lone figure, barely visible, with a bright sun in my eyes, but still too substantial to be a mere ghost. My wounds were a testament to that. Once the doctor had finished patching me up, I sat in the waiting room and tried calling the former owners, the siblings, one after the other, I wanted to know what had attacked me. If anyone knew what I was walking into, there'd be hell to pay if so. The oldest son was the first to answer. I didn't go all in straight away. I asked probing questions, took my time before I mentioned the basement. The guy laughed when I brought it up, told me he hated going down there as a kid because he'd heard the weirdest noises like someone moaning. They all thought a ghost lived down there in the dark, and to keep them from hurting themselves or playing around with stuff they shouldn't, their father had embellished this ghost, given it a name. Marion lived in the basement, hiding amongst the crates of old photos and clothes. She lurked behind the half-disassembled lawnmower, scuttling away to the dark places at the very edge of your eyesight. Marion had long fingernails and a haggard flower sack dress. She had dark lips and a pointed nose and a wart the size of your thumb. Marion ate children, their dad had told them with glee. And if Marion knew there were three bite-sized kids living just above her, she'd come out of the basement and come crawling up the stairs with arms as long as her body, and she'd slink away into the bedrooms using the shadow as cover and she'd start by taking tiny little bites out of any bare feet that lay dangling in the cold. What about that freezer? Did you ever use it? I asked. Oh god no, he said. Even now that basement gives me the creeps, and that freezer was where Marion lived. Or oh, so we figured as kids, so we stayed the hell away from it. It was just always there in the back, looking old and forgotten. I think dad used to go hunting when we were little, and that's where he kept the meat. But he phased all that out before I turned five. He seemed so sincere that I didn't tell him what I'd found in that house at the end of my inspection. He didn't know that behind that freezer was a false wall, and behind that false wall, basement number two, homemade. God knows how the father managed it with no one noticing, but he dug it out and made a private, soundproof space, hollowed out a room about the size of your typical jail cell. The furniture was threadbare, deliberately so, a single mattress propped up against one wall, an iron shackle bolted into the foundation, a dentist chair modified with restraints, and a stain. A vague Rorschach blob of ancient browns and almost greens that pulled outwards from a patch in the corner. It had texture. I knew that stain. I'd seen it before. Residue left behind after the professionals had finished peeling a desiccated corpse off a hard surface. At first, I assumed someone had moved the source of that stain. There were even footprints. But... They didn't look right. Something about them made me queasy. They'd not been left in the residue. They were made of it. Something or someone covered in that stuff had been stomping around down there. Until that moment, the inspection had been mundane and boring. But it isn't every day you stumble across a hidden dungeon. Now... I was suddenly presented with a hell of a family secret, 
and one that didn't quite make sense. I stood there for a good minute, trying to make the piece of that puzzle fit. Had someone moved a corpse and gotten covered in rotten flesh and walked around leaving a trail? If so, why the hell had they done it barefoot? And why not clean up afterwards? And how had they been so clumsy, yet so clean as well? There were no drag marks. I took another look at those prints, and something inside my gut soured. Small feet. A woman's. We all know this story. Don't make me go over it. Basement out in the middle of nowhere. Restraints. A family man that no one suspects. He'd hunted all right. Sicko. So, who had died in that basement, and who had left those prints? Not all of them were on the floor, either. With an increasingly shaky hand, I tracked a few to the wall, where they mounted the vertical surface and continued upwards and onto the ceiling. Just like that, a cold sweat gathered on the back of my neck, and a powerful sense of the uncanny ran over me like icy water. Somewhere overhead, the wind blew, and the boughs of trees groaned in the yard. Sounds of another world. I could see it in my mind, up there, not far away. My car, sitting in the shade. Those images felt like they belonged to another world, though. I desperately wanted to rejoin it, to leave this squalid little hole behind. All I had to do was walk out of that basement and make it for my car. Only, I wasn't so sure I wanted to move at all. Felt like I might break something brittle. The notion that the creeping dread I felt was all in my head. A product of an overactive imagination, nothing more. And yet, I got this feeling that if I tried to run, the nightmare would spill out into the real world and give chase. I even tried telling myself I didn't know what happened in that room. Not for sure. It could have been a game, one played between him and the wife. But then I looked at the chair again, at the cracked and frayed leather of ancient straps. There were teeth marks on some of them. I took a deep breath and regained control of my legs. Unless I saw something alive down there, I had to assume I really was alone. So I turned and began to walk. Eyes forward, mind steeled against the myriad of little groans and creaks that felt as if they followed me, going from shadow to shadow. I couldn't stop myself from filling in the blanks of that basement's history, even as I told myself to stop. Maybe she died first. Maybe he did. Maybe he got bored and left it to starve. Or maybe he nearly got caught and decided to put an end to it all. Maybe she snuck something sharp and did it herself. But she died for sure and she stayed dead a long time. At least a couple of months for that kind of liquefaction. She lost a lot of cohesion. Skin, muscle, blood. Like the plug of mold that forms on top of forgotten coffee. I could see it in my head, her collapse, the claymation time lapse, a riot of colours, only somehow the natural cycle broke. She didn't go away completely, and no one came to take her away. Those were her prints on the floor, and walls, and ceiling, weren't they? She laid down, she died, and then, somehow... She got back up. By the time I reached the top of the basement steps, I'd scared myself so bad that sweat was pouring off me. So far, the only things I'd seen on my way were just old boxes and crates and ancient bits of crap. Weed whackers and leaf blowers with cobwebs and defunct logos fading away. But that didn't mean I was alone. There was something wrong with that place. I could feel it. 
a radiant heat, a palpable aura of hatred, even in the absence of anything seemingly real. It was so bad that as I opened the door, I actually felt a moment of childlike relief. A little like how you might feel racing back to bed after going to the toilet in the middle of the night, convinced some ghost was just inches behind you. I laughed. And something cold and hard wrapped around my ankle. A hand had reached up between the slats of the stairs, like it was reaching straight out of the world of make-believe and into this one where things are real. I stared down, heartbeat like thunder in my ears, and slowly began to process what I was seeing in bits and pieces. First was the hand. Gnarled, black, like a badly sketched shadow visible only because it caught the light coming through the open door. And then beneath it, in the shadow, a face like a skull wrapped in a garbage bag, the plastic pulled tight so you could see the suffocating outline of empty eyes and a gaping mouth. I'd expected something. Wetter. Something straight out of a bad horror movie. In reality, whatever was in that basement had undergone a strange transformation. I only ever saw it in parts, so I can't say for sure what all of it was like, but it sure as hell didn't look like a ghost or a corpse or anything else I'd ever seen or thought I'd seen in life or movies. It looked like a monster, the real deal, and I reacted like a child seeing the boogeyman. I made some weird, half-muffled groan of fear and ripped my leg away so quickly that I surprised myself and got free. But whatever was hiding under those stairs was quick. Before I had time to take another step, it had left its hiding place, climbed the stairs, and was already driving me to the ground. The last thing I saw before my chin smashed into the kitchen floor was that Marion really did wear a flower sack dress. At the time, this strange detail passed over me without notice, but in hindsight, the fact that the son would later recount that particular item of clothing convinced me his father had been the man responsible for that hidden basement. It wasn't like it had been waiting undiscovered when the family moved in, and on top of that, the father must have been a real piece of crap to inject that sort of sickening detail into a story he told his kids. He'd likely done it, so if his prisoner ever escaped and his kids saw her, their first instinct would be to scream for their lives and run. I didn't know any of this at the time, of course. I had only vague notions of what had attacked me. Something hateful, for sure. Something that had died in that awful room and come back to life. God, she was so angry. She pinned me, knelt on my back, and howled like a banshee that had been hit by a car. I was terrified at the sound, at the feeling of helplessness, and the realization that this was a nightmare I couldn't wake up from. She went to work on my back with fingers I couldn't see, but could feel as white-hot tattoo needle pain. It lasted only a few seconds. The agony was enough to send me into spasms that knocked her off and onto the floor. A tiny moment of freedom was all I needed. I crawled to my feet and jumped headfirst out the nearest window. I didn't give a damn about any cuts I might acquire. If you could have felt what I felt, you wouldn't have either. These weren't scratches. Doctors compared my wounds to those left by box jellyfish, the kind of thing that causes muscles beneath the wilt and wither after a million hypodermic needles have turned the flesh into porous sponge. I had to get skin grafts. I had to get rid of my car because they couldn't scrub what I'd left of my skin from the leather seats. Even now, my back looks like I got run over by a mower. Still hurts when I put my top on each morning. Somehow, they're not even the worst of my wounds. 
just the biggest, the most visible. At least those scars made it easy to convince the bank not to sell. Normally, it takes a lot of effort, but they took one look at the doctor's reports and agreed to condemn it thoroughly. Pass the land onto whatever strange governmental department handles this kind of thing. That particular house had been left to crumble. No piece of paper or deed or mortgage payment is taking it back from Marion. We can only shut it off. The land is fenced and every window has been slapped with so many toxic gas signs that I can only hope no one else is stupid enough to ever go back inside. Looking back, I really should have listened to my instincts. Squatters don't leave a place alone without good reason. It'd be wrong to say I don't like kids. It's adults I have more of a problem with. In my last school, when I called one of the ten-year-old boys in my class a little asshole, he wasn't the problem. His parents were the ones who insisted I get fired. But that boy didn't mind me swearing at him, because he knew damn well he'd keyed my car, even if I had no proof. He just thought it was funny. No different to the sort of interaction he'd have with an older sibling. On that note, I wouldn't say I like children either. Kids are little adults. They're more truthful, but only because the stakes are lower. People with jobs and mortgages tell great big tremendous lies. Kids don't have the weight of the world on their shoulders, so why lie about mistresses and promotions and why you've been crushing up antibiotics into your wife's morning smoothie? Instead, they just lie about where their homework is. The kids I teach are right on the cusp of it. Some of the boys might get caught giggling at the back or showing each other naughty little videos they don't understand but can't look away from. But then they go out and chase each other around, do cartwheels, play tag, hide and seek, cry if they take a particularly bad knock. Kids are weird. Got one whose dad is in jail and he talks about it like it means nothing. His old man tried to kick a woman to death in the parking lot of a bar and won't be out until the boy's a teenager. Kid don't care, doesn't get it. If anything, he thinks it's funny. But then last week, I confiscated his novelty pencil that was the size of a cucumber and he screamed so hard he threw up all over the speckled tile that have been glued to the floor since 96. 10 is a weird age. Old enough to feel the vaguest hint of life's problems just beneath the surface like lumps in a pillow. To question why mommy downs three bottles of wine on a Tuesday. Or why daddy changes his shirt and hides it in the garage before coming in from work. But too young to know what's really under the surface. These kids can feel something is wrong with the world. They just don't know what. Not yet, anyway. They have my sympathy. 26 years of teaching has eroded most of everything else. I'm not particularly invested in whether these little turds become scientists or janitors, nor am I particularly interested in helping them process their emotional luggage. If any of you want me to undo the damage you've done to your own kids, then you could start by paying me a hell of a lot more. But I do feel sorry for them, because they don't really know what's going on. But unlike a five-year-old, they can't just fumble around in blind ignorance. They're stuck, in between worlds. One where you cry yourself to sleep at night over your parents' divorce, but still think Santa and the Tooth Fairy are real. Maybe it's different at a rich school, one where kids don't go to food banks, or where whole families don't have to share a smartphone. I doubt it. Don't know why. I just doubt anyone's out there living the plot of the Bernstein Bears, rich or otherwise. I used to dream of teaching at one of the big schools a couple of towns over, the ones with all the funding. Oh, that'd be nice. 
walking into a building that doesn't look like a set dressing for the next season of True Detective. Now I just dream of getting out of this profession entirely. Maybe if I play my cards right. Sounds crazy to say out loud, so I won't. But maybe I found a way out. Well, to be exact, the kids found it. Don't know what they got? Of course they don't. The kids, they haven't a clue. But I think I'm maybe 13 weeks from another go. And when that happens, you can bet your ass I'm asking for a ticket out of here. At first, I planned on getting a cushy job in one of the schools a few towns over. One where the school bus doesn't have to plan its route around multiple trailer parks. Now I realize, I was thinking small. If I'm smart, I won't ever have to work another day in my life. Imagine that. Thirteen more weeks. Right now, Grinwig is with Layla. Sweet girl, but she's smart enough for it to be a problem. The dumb ones fare the best. You wake up to something grinning at you at your bedroom window. It helps to have a sort of mind that doesn't ask questions about what floor you're living on. Layla isn't winning a genius grant anytime soon, but I can tell it's bothering her, because deep down, she knows how wrong this all is. Dark circles under the eyes, pallid skin, eyes that keep darting to the corners. Sometimes she falls asleep at a desk, sometimes she wakes up with a little jump, like something only she can see has startled her. It's hard. Only reason she sticks it out is the same reason you or I would. The rewards. She got a smartphone last time. I wonder what it'll be this time. These kids don't ask for a lot. Toys mainly. One of them got crazy good at football real quick. That makes sense. But it's that kind of thing, you know. They don't ask for the lottery or nothing like that because money's a little too abstract right now. Strange thing though, as young and naive as they are, they learn the rules pretty quickly. I guess Grenwig's lessons aren't subtle. Just look at one of my former students, Jared. Now at the time, all this flew under my radar. Kid in my class lost the parent, moved away. So what? Things happen. Turns out, he asked for his father to get sober. Next day, the poor guy got caught in the machinery at his job. CCTV footage was very popular in live leaks. Makes for grim viewing. I'm not particularly handy, so I never knew a lathe could do that to a human body. Anyway, it's not good to ask things for other people. I wish my dad was this. I wish my mum was that. Oof. Alia told me that up front around the time I started asking why half the kids in my class had new iPhones and Nintendo Switches. She said it was easy to ask for things, but it was riskier to ask to change something into another thing, and downright awful to ask it to change a person in any way, no matter how small. Even that kid who got good at football played a risky game. It paid off, but the other kids wouldn't go near him for a week. They kept expecting something bad to happen to him, and they didn't want to be in the splash zone. I can't pretend to understand the subtleties. Like the kids, I can only observe what happens to other people and learn the lessons that impart. Nothing about Grenwig is guaranteed. There are no certainties. Even the kids get worn down by it. Whoever has it, they're a pariah. Risk assessment in under 11s. Strange thing to see. But unless it's your turn, you don't even want to risk something as inane as a game of catch with his chosen friend. Grenwig is territorial, possessive, bizarre. Didn't even believe it. Until it was somehow my turn, which the kids found pretty alarming. Grenwig 
doesn't like adults. I thought it was a ghost at first. Lights coming on and off. Footsteps in the corridor outside my apartment. Pretty creepy, sharing my home with something I couldn't see. I didn't like it, but it had only been a couple of nights, and I did a good job of convincing myself there was no ghost or poltergeist. Just an overactive imagination. Yeah, sure, the TV changed, and there were finger marks on my bathroom window I hadn't put there. So what? Way at the back of my mind, I'd reserved a little bit of space for the possibility of a haunting, but otherwise, I remained a skeptic. Jesus, if only it was as simple as a haunting. I don't know if I could explain to you how it felt the first time I woke up to Grinwig gently stroking my toes. The violation of it, the feeling of a world that didn't make sense. My eyes glared at his fingers, terrified, heart pounding, head throbbing like I'd taken a knock and I kept waiting for it to make sense. My eyes wandered, tried to find the hands those fingers belonged to, but they just kept going, and going, and going. They stretched for meters until they disappeared into the shadow of my closet. Whole time, they kept massaging the big toe, cold as ice. I started counting the knuckles. I got to 13, and gave up. But they were fingers. I could tell from the nails. The hair that ran along the dimpled skin the color of cement. And then, just as I started to really appreciate that I was awake, 100% stone cold sober and lucid. And what I was seeing wasn't a dream or a nightmare or some other conjuration of the mind. Just as I felt panic begin to flare up inside my chest like a burgeoning heart attack, those impossible fingers withdrew into the darkness like a spider curling its legs. I got up and threw on the lights. I found my closet empty. I felt the world was coming apart. Had to be a night terror, I decided. I hadn't had one for decades, but what else could it be? I wanted to go back to sleep, to at least try, but I was so scared I couldn't face the dark again, so I decided to stay up, went out into the living room and turned the TV on, plopped down on the sofa and let my head tilt back. I might have drifted off again, I don't know for sure. All I remember was the feeling as the cushion beneath me adjusted and I heard it, the sound of something tightening, like a creaking door. I looked down and saw white bands wrapped around the entirety of the sofa, fingers. They tightened and the material let out a groan as the tension went up a notch. I flew upwards in a terrible panic. By the time I turned back, the fingers were gone but the indent they'd left on the sofa remained. This repeated itself all night. Each time I felt close to drifting off, those impossibly long fingers would reach out of the darkness somewhere and make an appearance. They knocked glasses off countertops, opened the fridge, turned on the oven, and whenever possible, they touched me, stroked an ear, tickled my nose, slid between my fingers and tried to hold my hand. I tried to play chicken with it at least once. I stayed stock still as a greasy finger plucked at my lips and tried to find its way into my mouth. But before it met any success, I flipped out and ran shrieking into the corridor outside my apartment. Panting in the hallway, I told myself I'd never step foot in that apartment but there was something about the way all my neighbors came to their doors one by one and just stared at me in my underwear and sweat-stained vest. I felt like a damn idiot before I knew it. I was offering modeled apologies while slinking through my front door. 
By the time I got to school the next day, I felt like I was teetering on the edge of a breakdown. I genuinely suspected my day was going to end with me being carted off in a straitjacket. Last people I expected to find any understanding from were my students. But when I came in looking like a sleep-deprived drunk, they all stared at me in silence. And this wasn't the slack-jawed idiocy I'm sometimes used to with these kids. Like that time I told them I used to have a wife. This was something else. It took me a second to decipher it. Not the sort of expression I'm used to from that age group. With, what, with half of them being miniature psychopaths. It was sympathy. They felt sorry for me. But when I took a step forward... Every single one of them scooted their chairs backwards. Just like that, it clicked. I spent the last year watching them take turns ostracizing one another, and I just ridden it off as just a peculiar product of childhood social dynamics. It felt cruel, and I tried over and over to mitigate it. To sit with the excluded kids and talk with them, try to figure it all out. But it was an enigma. All of it. If it wasn't for the fact that this messed up system seemed to operate on a kind of rotor, I would have been forced to intervene. But as it was, the kid who was targeted would always be back with the crowd a week later, and they'd be the ones excluding someone else. But now all of that made sense. The way they were looking at me. Pity recognition. They knew what I'd spent the night going through, and for the last year, they'd gone through it themselves, one by one. You should play with Grenwick, sir. One of the quieter girls piped up, looking wide-eyed like a hostage at gunpoint, and all the other kids nodded. Yeah, he wants to play. You need to play with him. He gets real impatient. A chorus of whispered ahas. Grenwig, I muttered. One word. Is that what it's called, I wondered. And all the other kids nodded, but they could read my mind. There are no records of Grenwig anywhere, by the way. Good God, I tried a thousand times over to find something. Anything. The best I could think of was that Grenwig was a kind of boogeyman. But what does that even mean? Just a word used to give the world a little more shape, a little more structure. I'm not sure Greenwich has much of either. The games he plays are like what a toddler or a young dog would be interested in. Basic stuff, no rules. I move something, Greenwich moves it back. Hours lost tracing the spiral of my hair, or pulling at my cheeks and face to create strange new expressions, or flicking the lights on and off. During that time, I took to eating lunch in my car, largely because it was hard to be around people who couldn't see why a glass went flying at the wall, or why I had to keep stacking plates until they were so tall they toppled over. At least the kids gave me a heads up. Most important warning I ever got in my life. Every kid had their own observations, some more relatable than others. Most of them boiled down to the simple fact that for seven days, you belonged to Grenwig. You were a toy, a source of endless amusement for something that had the sense of humor of a three-year-old. Pretty much every kid agreed on one concrete thing though. Saying no to Grenwig was dangerous. Now, I can't say for sure, but I'm positive Grenwig gave the kids more leeway. He left them alone for lunch and dinner. Bedtime games were usually quieter. But for me, it was almost like part of the game was watching me go about my adult life as he did everything to mess with me. He'd snatch my steering wheel giggling from the dark footwell, yellow eyes peering up from between my legs. He'd grab my phone and throw it into the middle of traffic, 
or sit there tickling my neck and armpits as the principal demanded to know why my class's behavior was so erratic. He made it difficult, pushed me right up to breaking point. Eventually, I snapped. I slapped his hand away as he tried to mess with me during a traffic stop. Felt like screaming at him that he was this close to getting me shot. But of course, I couldn't. Just had to sit there as this cop looked over my license and mulled giving me a sobriety test. Couldn't blame him. I'd been swerving all over the road until I saw the flashing lights. Didn't help when, as he approached my pulled over car, he saw me slapping furiously at the steering wheel hissing, Stop it! Over and over. He inevitably issued the test, which I passed. The cop gave me a long, narrow-eyed stare before telling me to go get some sleep. He must have figured I was just a stressed mental case instead of a drunk, and he was right. It was day six, and I'd barely slept. Despite all the grave warnings from the kids about the dangers of telling Grenwick off, I drove off hoping that maybe he would just let this one go. I went to school and taught lessons as usual. But Grenwig made no appearances. I asked the kids if his little rotor ever found itself wrapping up a day early, and they all shook their heads, like they knew bad news was coming my way. But none of them wanted to say for sure. Still, it was my first time, so I ignored the look in their eyes and tried my best to focus on the hope that maybe Grenwig was going to finally leave me alone. A feeling that dissolved in its entirety when I opened my front door and found a package on the floor. A large box about one foot cubed. It looked like old cardboard, like what happens when it gets soaked but left out to dry. Just dingy. Its sides had been stapled together too, and that gave it a real homemade look that went the extra creepy little mile. I expected something bad. I knew the second when I went to lift it and it was too heavy that something was wrong. It just felt... Well, it felt like lifting an overfull bucket from the bottom. And then, there was the smell and the noise that sounded like a distant transmission of a mewing child. Tinny, like the muffled cries of someone on the other side of a very thick wall. When I finally opened it, I found the policeman inside, familiar because of the shield and name. He, well, he'd been folded, I guess is the best way I can describe it. At first, I thought it was just his uniform, but, well, clothes aren't warm and obviously a folded uniform wouldn't explain the forearm hair and skin poking out the side. I recoiled, terrified, fell backwards onto my ass, and this was when Grenwig made his appearance. His arachnid fingers curled out from the box. I'd say about a dozen of them this time. There are always more in the dark, out of sight, and these did what I couldn't have brought myself to do on my own. They unfolded the policeman, lifted him up like a tailor showing off a suit, and the flayed skin opened up to reveal the barely recognizable outline of an adult man. He was still alive, and the rest of him, I soon found out, was in my bathtub, and that half was also very much alive thrashing and sliding as it struggled to gain a grip on the smooth ceramic, begging for its other half. Words I don't really think were a natural fit for the stern man who'd interrogated me just ten hours ago. But then again, it wasn't really the same man. Either way, he spoke of the darkness between atoms, the infinite space where time doesn't exist, and the endless shapes that swim the murky abyss 
fleeing their cruel god. More than that, he lamented no longer being whole, feeling himself in two places at once. He called it wrong, and on that, he had my agreement. I begged Grenwig to take it away, to undo what he had done. And that was how I used my first favour. The box and the man disappeared, dragged off to some dark corner that was out of sight, and that was the last I saw of him. Although a bit of research later on revealed that while Grenwick did indeed put him back together, the poor man has been catatonic in a hospital bed ever since. Alive, but definitely not well. The next day, the kids asked me what I'd requested. I told them I asked for a new PlayStation. Didn't tell them the truth, partially because it would traumatize them, but partially because acknowledging it even happened would traumatize me. After that, I crunched the numbers. I figured out the number of kids and how often the rotor would fall on me. Based on this info, I booked the week off ahead of time and, well, I just waited. I tried to support the kids as best I could when it was their turn, but they didn't really have the same problems as me. I mean, it wasn't a holiday for them either. Each one came to school looking like they'd spent the night watching their dog die over and over. Just distraught, ruined, exhausted. But like I said, Grenwig generally let them eat their food or interact with their parents and siblings without demanding attention at the worst possible time. Eventually, round two came along. The kids seemed damned relieved. As for Grenwig's games, this time I came prepared. I'd already noticed that Grenwig only ever emerged from the shadows, and the kids corroborated that fact. So in the run up to my turn, I spent the week setting up my bathroom with as many lamps and torches as I could find. It wasn't easy to eliminate all those shadows. I had a lot of sleepless nights trialing different arrangements, but eventually I got one as close to perfect as I could. I figured if I could just have one or two nights of sleep, it'd be damn easier to deal with. An hour passed before my stomach began to ache. By the time I realized what Grenwig was doing, I could already feel the urge to throw up. Guess I hadn't given him much of a choice. He wanted to play, and there was only one place in that room that was still dark. It wasn't until I threw myself out into the living room and switched off all the lights that the pain eased up. But by then, I was already close to suffocating on the finger sticking out of my throat. When it finally withdrew and I took my first breath in over a minute, I collapsed to the floor, unable to do much of anything except heave and sob. Grenwig, yellow eyes glaring at me from the space between my sofa, giggled. In hindsight, I'm lucky he found it funny. I think he thought it was a game of sorts. God knows what would have happened if that little stunt had made him mad. Otherwise, that second round passed without incident. At least I wasn't at work. It was hell, but I didn't have to worry about driving anywhere or being out in public waiting for those wretched hands to find me. I just stayed indoors and played his weird little games, which mainly just involved me cleaning up whatever stupid thing he decided to make a mess of. I found it helped if I played up my exasperation. The less I reacted to his mischief, the more likely he'd escalate. When it was all over, I asked for a winning lottery ticket. Unfortunately, I didn't specify the amount, which I suppose is my fault. At least the amount I won covered rent that month, even if my expectations were a little higher. Still, I figured it'd be better next time. 
I'd be more specific, I decided. Best laid plans of mice and men. You ever lost someone? Most people have. I have for sure. More than once too. It nearly unmade me, and I was a fully grown man. It was about a couple days before my turn that Alia experienced the first loss. Most kids, it's a hamster. If they're unlucky, a grandparent. For her, it was her older brother. I taught him 11 years earlier, and he was a good kid. Smart like her. Went on to become a mechanic. His passing wasn't anything strange or sinister. Just an accident. Jack popped off. Car crushed him. Random. Devastating. She was called out of a lesson by the principal and her parents, the three of them looking like hell, like they'd spent a month one-on-one -on -one with Grenwig. A little reminder that not all nightmares hide in the dark, I suppose. I don't know why this hit me hard. I think it was probably my own experience with grief. Either way, it stuck with me. Her absence, the empty chair and desk, Felt hard to ignore day after day, knowing what she was going through. I think it's one thing to accept that these kids will face circumstance. Poverty, bad parents, life isn't fair. I don't get a say in the way society says some kids get ponies and others get rickets. But there's something about losing someone that way. Just a random confluence of bad luck that hits harder than most. I don't know if I can explain it. It's just Aelia was already grown up at the bottom rung of our not very invisible class system. Hadn't she had a fair share of bad luck already? I mean, damn, even Grenwig grants favours. Even that wretched monster isn't all bad. But an accident like what happened to Alia's brother. There's no upside. It's just a mess. Thing is, like I said... My turn was coming up. And I mean, the way I saw it, the boy was already dead, right? It wasn't like he could die getting wrapped up three times around a lathe. Worse that had already come to pass. I decided to do something that even at the time, I figured to be pretty stupid. But if there was a chance it could work, well, I had to try. Round three with Grenwick. Went real easy. I preemptively bought a bunch of jigsaws and left them half done. He honed in on them straight away. I did as much as I could in a single sitting, turned around, turned back, and he'd muddled them all up. I'd play up my anger and irritation, then go back to it. Drank a lot of coffee and whiskey, watched a lot of movies. Grenwig loved it. Broke a couple plates and mugs too. It was an all plain sailing. Woke up one night to find him licking my neck and had to rush to the hospital to get the chemical burn treated. Still, for the most part, the week went by without much incident because... Well, I had something in mind. Couldn't get it out. This idea, I had to act on it. And the promise of what it would mean... If it worked, meant I practically skated through the week with a smile on my face. At least I had the sense to specify the boy returned to me, not Alia. I thought if anything went wrong, it'd be best if she didn't have to see it. It was four in the morning when I was awoken by a sound that had slipped into my dreams as a kind of creaking door. But as I opened my eyes and reality reasserted itself, I realized that what I was actually hearing was a little more gravel being trod on. Strange, distant, quiet. I held my breath, if only so that I could hear better. But it seemed to only amp up the sound of blood rushing through my ears. White noise. It's so hard to perceive what's there sometimes, isn't it? All I wanted was for my ears or eyes to report something useful to me 
without having to get out of the safety of my own bed. Instead, all I got were dim shadows and the sea-like susurrations of my own breathing. At least I could ascertain, I wasn't alone in my apartment. Over time, the longer I waited, the more sure of that I became. Something was out there, in the corridor between my bedroom and the living room at a guess, moving with a kind of irregular rhythm that belongs only to living things. This wasn't the wind or some pipe settling. Something was moving. And it was moving in my direction. Low to the ground. A noise I couldn't put any shape to. Wrong. All wrong. Made me think of breaking pencils, grinding teeth. In the end, I couldn't help myself. I got up and called out. Who's there? The words didn't feel real to me. The world took on a realer than real distortion that comes with terror, coupled with a prickling white heat at the nape of the neck. For a moment, I swore I was outside my own body, staring down at myself from above. It was too much. But that sound was clearer than ever before. There was no pretending. This ghost wasn't real. I turned on the light. Alia's brother screamed and crawled away from the light. Neglected whimpers left behind like a trail that led me to the living room where I found him curled around a table leg. He was alive, but not whole. Guess I hadn't given much thought to what a car would do to a man's chest. Every breath was a strange orchestra. Too many sounds to disentangle. Bone on bone, crumbled ribs expanding, or at least trying to, and drawing oxygen into blood-filled lungs. Moss had grown across his face, even in the short time he'd been in the ground. A hand, ice cold, shot out and grabbed my wrist and cried out, but he didn't let go. He followed as I tried to push myself away, his bottom half trailing along, limp and misaligned with his torso. Felt like pulling a sack of meat across an ice rink. Don't send me back, he whimpered. Don't send me back. Eventually, my foot hit the sofa and I fell into it. He dragged himself using his hands over to the side so that we were face to face before I even had time to push myself upright. He likes you, he whispered, and I recoiled at the smell of his breath. There are so few things in the dark that know how to leave, but he does. Don't, don't ask him to send me back, please. For the first time, my mind started working. Was he talking about Grenwig, I wondered. But of course, I told myself, who else? What, what's over there? I asked. He went to answer before the words choked in his mouth and his face twisted into a mask of melancholic agony. Trying to utter something, he burst into painful sobs. Don't make me go back, was all he could manage to say. Don't make me go back. Don't make me go back. Please, please don't send me back there. You don't know what they do to us. I don't... I don't know what to do. I stammered. The boy grabbed me and pulled me close, unsure of how to comfort him. I let him hold me in an embrace. We aren't the same when it's done with us. What? I never saw him take the knife from the kitchen, but I suppose he'd been in my home for longer than I'd been awake, and he had plenty of opportunity. First thing I felt, which surprised me even in the moment, was that it suddenly became hard to breathe. 
That was the punctured lung. Felt like the worst ammonia I'd ever had come over me in the space of five seconds. Just boom, suffocating on your own blood, so much that it spilled over my lips and down my chin. By the time I registered the aching waves of dull agony pulsing out of the spot on my ribcage, I was already slumping back down onto the sofa, sitting there like I was getting ready for a Friday night move. Not that I was helpless. I took maybe two seconds, tops, to accept what had happened, to understand it, and then I was able to drive my heel into his head as he tried to climb up onto me. Weirdly, his broken back helped him. He sort of just bent with a blow, but it didn't actually dislodge him. I had to kick him again to do that, and then I had to stand up and do it again and again. And I think around the fourth or fifth kick, I realized I had something of a problem. The pain didn't really bother him. Not when I kicked him in his pulp chest, not when I stamped on his hand as he tried to push himself back up for the tenth time, not even when I rolled him over and stamped on his head, struggling to aim my foot through the tears in my eyes. Even as I'd immobilized him, even as I fumbled around and found an old bike helmet and clubbed his skull until my arm grew sore. He didn't cry out in pain. He just kept trying to get back up. Damn! I screamed as seconds turned to minutes, which just kept ticking on. I felt like I was swinging for hours, but in truth, I don't know how long. Eventually, I stopped for breath and frantically looked from one corner of the room to another, desperate for the first time in my life to see those horrible long fingers. Take him, I cried. For God's sake, take him back. I suspected he'd been waiting and watching, because with very little delay, Grenwig finally made his appearance. Yellow eyes clustered together like frog spawn, winked at me from a shadow under the table. They seemed self-satisfied, as they always did. But I didn't care. The mutilated man who lay on the floor continued to bark with wet laughter, pouring at me with broken fingers. I was feeling faint, and my whole right side was burning hot and cold all at once as warm blood began to pool. Oh God, I cried. Just take him back. Grinwig's hands wasted little time, and that man's laughter grew only more hysterical as the fingers wrapped around his chest and legs and slowly towed him towards the dark. I felt a brief moment of relief as I hoped this would be the end of my mistake. But then, I felt his arms wrap around my legs. Even broken, his strength was something special. Trapped in a bear hug, slowly being pulled toward that abyssal shadow, I began to panic. But it was far too little and far too late. I went feet first, a feeling like nothing else I'd ever had. In the end, I was clinging by the tips of my fingers to an impossible ledge. Above me was a sort of opening with no defined beginning or end, and on the other side laid my living room. I looked down, and for the first time saw Grenwig as a whole. In hindsight, it had been a mistake to think of him as humanoid. I think I just decided the boogeyman should look like a man, but what floated in the strange ether beneath me was more akin to a jellyfish, or maybe a spider. I don't know. It was dark in that void, and yet impossibly clear. I could see things in there, more than just Grenwig. It defied dimensions as we understand it. It was both an ocean and a landscape. In the distance, leviathans swam through open space. I'm not even sure I was seeing based on light. When I blinked, I still saw everything. Grenwig found it all hilarious. 
He had a mouth, and it laughed maniacally as it peeled Elia's brother from around my waist, leaving me free to kick and pull my way back into reality. As I slid onto the carpet on my living room, his laughter persisted. As soon as I was out, I crawled and rushed to the bathroom where I locked the door and passed out. Grenwick's next turn with me lasted two weeks, which I think was because I made two requests, one for Alia's brother to return from the dead and the other for him to be taken away. Either way, I didn't begrudge Grenwick's games, but it did mean I didn't get another request. I have to wait until next time. Meanwhile, I've watched the children approach the end of the school year, and I find myself wondering if they'll age their way out of Grenwig or take him with them to the next teacher's class. If he leaves them alone, will he terrorize the next lot of kids I teach? Either way, I think Grenwig will let me double up again. And that's important, because if so, I know what I'm going to do. Like I said before, I'm out of here. No more teaching. I'm cashing out. But I've decided, after what I did to Elia and her brother, that I can at least take Grenwig with me. He can become a permanent friend. Leave the kids the hell alone. I don't want him following them or haunting the next bunch to come along. I'm going to stuff my pockets so full of cash that I can build him and me a playground and he won't ever have to bother them again. They have enough to deal with. Back in April of 2013, I was a building and zoning inspector for Mon County, West Virginia. We were situated in an office up in Morgantown, where I usually worked with zoning permits and annual municipal building inspections. Not the most exciting job, but in my line of work, the best day in the job is the day when nothing happens. The fight against entropy is constant, and I had a sign hanging above my desk to remind me of such. It simply read, Everything breaks in cursive, with a baby cherub in the corner. I remember being called up early one morning. There had been some sort of geological event, and every inspector would be pulled off desk duty. We needed immediate building inspection in the area surrounding the outskirts of Greenbrier Valley. We were to coordinate our efforts with a central command up in Green County. That morning, it seemed like everything was topsy-turvy. The local news talked about an escaped murderer, and we were getting calls about a lake being drained. The local hospital desperately needed blood donations, but couldn't tell us why. Overall, something was up, and neither of us liked it. But we went along with it. I was assigned to a full inspection of a farm close to the epicenter, the Oak Valley Grain Farm. I was handed a dossier on the owner, employees, tax records, zoning permits, all that stuff. But I was practically pushed out the door before I got the chance to go through any of it. I'd only finished half my morning coffee when I found myself standing in the parking lot with a stern looking man impatiently tapping his foot waiting for me to get on my way. Given the way they were hurrying us, I got the impression that something terrible had happened, and yet we were told to expect minimum damage, if any at all. Still, I had to remind myself of the external adage, everything breaks. That includes old barley farms. Once I was out on the road, I took some time at a rest stop to go through the dossier, mostly to get a feel for the place and an idea of what to look out for. So, the Oak Valley Grain Farm, a 75-acre area originally established in 1882. The site was used both as a barley farm 
and a lumber storage yard, as most of the surrounding area was covered in oak trees. A few years into operation, they expanded into having an off-site cooper and making their own barley malt for whiskey production. The original malting facility and accompanying barrel storage was still in use to this day. The one problem I could spot was the historical buildings. Oak Valley had a series of prohibition era buildings and underground storages, some of which were still being used. It was all legitimate and more of a quirk than anything, but those areas had not been properly inspected for years. The landowner had been reluctant to allow an inspector's free reign, and Mon County hadn't seen the use in harassing the owner because of what could be, at most, considered her curiosity. There was about a dozen employees, not counting irregular extra labour, the off-site Cooper workshop, and seasonal farm-to-table event organisers. I got there at about 10am. Even from the parking lot, I could see rolling hills of sprouting barley. Redbirds were circling overhead. Some kind of migrating species that had come home to roost. There was a constant low droning in the area, both from the machinery and emerging spring insects. The air was dense with the smell of rain-drenched manure and fertile soil. I was greeted by one of the equipment operators, Elsie, a quiet, middle-aged woman with a permanent squint on her face, like she was always blinded by the sun. I stifled the instinct to ask if she'd had a vision checked in the past six months and settled with shaking her hand. Welcome to Oak Valley, she smiled. Lacey will be out in a minute. Is the landowner in? I asked. Mr. Uh, Kettleman. Anders Kettleman? Yeah, he is usually not around that much, Elsie sighed. Lacey is the, uh, de facto boss lady. Runs the day-to-day -day operations. Anders is a sort of hands-off kind of guy, ever since he got sciatica. Sorry to hear that, I nodded. Let's see the boss lady then. Elsie showed me past the office and the silos. I was regretting not putting on more appropriate footwear, but most of my on-site inspections were usually municipal buildings. This was out of my comfort zone, and my feet would have to suffer for it. Manure ridden water pressed into my socks. I met Lacey Kettleman outside of the workshop. She was busy trying to get a hold of someone to finish the repairs on a secondary combine. Lacey was in her early thirties, but had already started to go grey. She held up a finger as we approached, finished the phone call, and turned to me with an eagerness to walk right through me. I'd met a lot of people like Lacey Kettleman before, but there was something about her that put me off. There was something... there. What's this about then? She asked, crossing her arms. A standard inspection, ma'am, I said, on account of the geological event in the area. We ain't had any geological events, she shrugged, so your services aren't necessary. This here is a sizable property, I said. I'm sure you haven't had the time to check if everything is up to code. I can help you with that. Then I'll be on my way. I appreciate that, but no. No need. Business as usual. I looked over at Elsie, still hovering on the outskirts of the conversation. I clutched my dossier and resumed eye contact. Miss Kettleman, do you mind explaining the problem with your combine harvester? I'm not entirely sure, she said. That's why I'm trying to get a hold of someone who does. Then would you mind me having a look at your garage? Or better yet, the combine? The combine doesn't constitute a building, sir. Not much use for a building inspector to take a look at that. Let's start with the garage then. While Lacey took off with her cell phone in hand, Elsie stayed by my side and guided me around the property. Turns out, Elsie was supposed to be the one to operate the second combine. Since it was out of commission, she didn't have much to do. 
She only had access to a few buildings, but was enough to get me started. First off was the garage. While Lacey had said there'd been no noticeable geological event, there were clear signs of disturbance. Several items had been knocked off the walls and there were web-like cracks in the concrete floor. Nothing major, but enough for me to take note. There was no way Lacey was unaware of this. I took some pictures, made some notes, and wandered off to check the storage sheds. Over the next few hours, Elsie escorted me through the grounds. While most buildings were off limits to her, and Lacey was nowhere to be found, I could still check the exterior. And while I didn't see anything obviously dangerous, there were clear signs of the area being disturbed. I could see the ground having shifted downhill from the storage sheds. Entire rows of barley were bent. While waiting for Lacey to meet us by the offices, Elsie and I started wandering by the edge of the grounds. There were plenty of oak trees there, historically used for making their own barrels, and there were several old trails snaking through the undergrowth. We were walking past the gazebo when I noticed an old well. Nothing out of the ordinary at first sight, but I noticed something strange about its algae. I took a closer look. Turns out the well was overflowing with water. Elsie seemed just as surprised as I was. It's been dried out for years, she said. That's definitely new. There was a pulse to it. Gulps of water making tiny bumps in the surface tension. Algae and lily pads overflowing, making a green circle around the stonework. It had a strange smell to it, like salt and ammonia. Lake water? This wasn't normal. We met up with Lacey, and I explained the various signs I'd seen around the farm. Elsie quietly retreated, not wanting to be dragged into the conversation. Lacey just nodded along, but didn't seem to react as I told her about the cracked concrete, the tilted rows of barley, or the various disturbed shelves. Seeing as there were clear signs of the area being affected, I told her I had to take a closer look at the structural integrity of the main buildings. And finally, there was the well. This time, she reacted. She had nodded and accepted everything up to that point, but all of a sudden she was defending herself. She tried to explain that the well was backed up and that they'd had a problem with water runoff in the past. There was nothing in the dossier about flooding, but Lacey was adamant. Also, arguing with her didn't do us any favours in gaining access to the farm interior. You can stall all day, Miss Kettleman, I reminded her, but we're not done until I say so. We're not keen on government folks skulking around, sir, Lacey smiled. This place has history. I told her I'd be back the next day, and the day after that, as many days as it took for me to do my job. Lacey just grinned. She wouldn't make it easy for me. I took some time checking in with the other inspectors. Turns out, I wasn't the only one who'd noticed some strange abnormalities. A lot of bursting pipes, it seemed. The local high school was also a mess. Not to mention the elementary school over in Juniper. I was given no details about it, except that no one was allowed on the premises and the entire school was sealed off, even for inspectors. By comparison, my overflowing well was nothing. And still, I couldn't shake the feeling that something about Lacey was off. I checked the dossier over and over that night, trying to make a game plan for the following day. I take some extra time checking the irrigation and plumbing and put an emphasis on the interior. Lacey would just have to comply. And yes, I'd even check the old Prohibition era storages. She'd just have to deal with it. I was up bright and early the following morning. I got to the Oak Valley Grain Farm at about 7am 
only to notice that it had been closed. Lacey had put up a sign on the door, closed for renovations. That was it. Maybe she figured we wouldn't have to conduct any inspections if there was no current business being conducted. But that's not how things work. I tried calling her, but got no response. I sent her a single text. She was either to open up the facility for inspection, or I had to take legal action. Shortly afterwards, she assured me she'd be there. One hour and thirty minutes later, Lacey came out of the main office building. Apparently, she'd been there all along. Strange though, she had no car in the parking lot. She was out of her work clothes, just having slept on a grey hoodie and a pair of torn jeans. She looked exhausted. Pleasant morning, I asked. I cursed myself for forgetting to bring appropriate footwear, again. Lacey didn't respond. She just wrapped her arms around herself and kept her head down. Something was wrong. We headed into the main building. Nothing out of the ordinary. No damage, no problem with the plumbing. All in all, it seemed perfectly fine. I couldn't figure out why she was so reluctant to show it to me. Then, I double-checked the dossier. Of course, there was the Prohibition-era cellar. Alright, I sighed. Time to head underground. Is that absolutely necessary? Lacey asked. It's a mess. We don't use it for much. You've been putting off an inspection for a long time, Miss Kettleman. Given the circumstances, I can't really motive putting it off any further. It's a cellar. She shrugged. There's not much that can go wrong with it. Everything breaks, ma'am. The door to the cellar was so small, I had to move sideways to fit. How they moved contraband whiskey through there back in the day was still a mystery to me. Still, I was there to check for damages, not sightseeing. We came down to a large open space with an 8 foot drop into a storage area. It was about 16 by 20 feet in total. There was an old steel ladder leading down, with two open paths leading deeper. A set of flashlights were hanging on the wall, so I brought one with me. As I put my hand on the first rung of the ladder, I noticed Lace's expression change. While she'd been angry or frustrated before, she looked almost apologetic now. This will complicate things, she sighed, but we'll work it out somehow. Sure thing. Now, the supports seem fine, I said, climbing down, but there might be damage further in. I stepped away from the ladder, taking in the smell of salt water and ammonia. The moment I did, Lacey pulled up the ladder. This caught me completely by surprise. I hadn't even considered that an option. The ladder just rattled away. I was left down there. It was so sudden, I didn't know what to say. I just threw my arms out in a confused shrug. What the hell? I'm sorry. Like hell you are. Put the ladder back. I can't. I'm calling the police. There was no coverage. We were too far underground. I was slowly realizing that she was going to leave me down there. All I had was this flimsy flashlight and a couple of hours of battery on my phone. Lacey remained up there, holding the ladder. I could feel my heart pounding drowning out the background noises in my head. I was growing short of breath, struggling to exhale. I've never been claustrophobic, but this was something else. Something darker. A real, actual threat to my life. They came to me, looking for shelter, Lacey said. They speak, you know. What are you talking about? They said you were coming. 
and I want to hear what else they have to say. You can't keep me here. We just need time. What do you... There was a sound coming from one of the side corridors. My heart shrunk and floated up into my throat. I held my breath, trying to hear the sound through my hammering pulse. I could feel my fingertips growing cold. It was a strange hissing sound, like someone trying to start a dying motor. Lacey stood at attention, listening intently. Something was down there with me. We came into their home, Lacey whispered. Now they're coming into ours. I backed into the corner of the room, only now noticing the thin layer of water covering the dirt floor. I turned off the flashlight and listened, trying to calm myself enough to not go into hyperventilation. Something was coming this way. Footsteps. Hello? Lacey whispered. Will you speak to me? The footsteps stopped. There was another hissing noise rattling me. It felt like someone was playing fiddle with my nerves. Of course, said Lacey. It's all yours. I could hear her stand up to leave, taking the ladder with her. The footsteps came closer. I tried to move, but I made too much noise. The footsteps stopped for a moment. I thought I'd scared it, frightened it, made it hesitant. Then it burst into a sprint. I turned my flashlight back on and ran down the corridor on the opposite side of the room. I tore down all kinds of debris as I went. Planks, old barrels, empty jars, whatever I could get my hands on. I glanced back, catching a pair of eyes coming out of the dark. A wide, shark-like mouth. A side room, some kind of meeting area. I jumped over a table, knocked it down, and backed away. Seconds later, the table was smashed in two. Fragments of wood scattered across the room, making my nose itch. But the thing stopped. It stayed just outside my vision, on the edge of the flashlight. It hissed again, sending another shiver up my spine. But somewhere in that vibration, I heard something. It wasn't a word, but a collection of scrambled thoughts, much like a word square, a jumble of information that you had to find your own meaning in. But rest assured, there was meaning. Fear. Anger. Hunger. What do you want from me? I asked. My flashlight flickered and the thing twitched. It was ready to strike, like a coiled snake. It hissed in response. Hunger. Hunger. Sadness. I retreated into the corner of the room, accidentally knocking over a shelf of empty Prohibition-era bottles. I could see the reflection of those dark eyes shining back at me as they patrolled back and forth, looking for an opening. Another hiss. A pleading, a promise, a bone-chilling coldness. It was starting to sound like language. An old, primal language. A language that could summarize so much with so little. I fumbled with my hands, looking for the biggest bottle I could find. Finally, I got a hold of an old wine bottle, waiting for the creature to hiss again. I readied the bottle for a throw. As soon as I felt that tingle in my spine, I knew I was about to hear it. I stood up, lowered my flashlight, and threw as hard as I could. There was a thick, fleshy thunk. The hissing stopped, and I could see the dark eyes rise another two feet into the air. The thing had been hunched over. Now, it was taller than the tunnel itself. 
It flinched, spitting out another word. With that single word, a series of impressions washed over me. Cold, water-filled tunnels, the crunch of raw fishbone in my mouth. Dying men in black togas, giving praise to a drowned god, hoping against hope to see another dawn. I didn't notice. I'd been zoning out. I'd lean the flashlight downwards, and I could see those dark orbs inching closer. I backed up against the wall and inched away, effectively sidestepping my way around the room. The creature followed my movements, matching them. I ended up with my back against the corridor. So, I turned to run. It was right behind me, and it was fast. I just kept going, hearing the hissing coming closer. Hunger, joy, hunger, warmth. I went straight through the storage room and into the opposing corridor. It twisted and turned, only to spit me out into a room with a slightly lower floor. I fell forward haphazardly, spraining my ankle and dropping the flashlight. In an instant, the flashlight flickered and died. I fumbled through my pockets, bringing out my phone. My hands were shaking so bad I couldn't unlock the screen. On the third try, I got it open and the flashlight app came on. This time, the creature was almost upon me. It screeched and retreated, blinded. It had too many limbs too many everything anger desperation leaving my phone on I tried to get back on my feet I couldn't my foot was too badly sprained I could hop around a bit at most but I was no match for whatever was out there instead I looked around the side room I was in it must have been some kind of armory. There were broken wooden crates and used up shotgun shells littering the floor. I used a bold oil lamp on the wall. Don't come in here, I said aloud. I'm not dying here. Hissing. A strange word hidden in the fog of my mind. A man handing a venomous snake to a golden woman. Rolling hills of endless crucified men. A certainty of a violent death, the wailing song of the doomed. It didn't understand my fear. I was already doomed. There was no point in fighting it. To the creature in the dark, time was an insignificant factor. I realized I'd been sitting there listening to it hiss to me for at least ten minutes. My cell phone was running hot and the water level had risen by about an inch. Of course, the water level. There had to be water coming from somewhere. Everything breaks. It was a miracle that I hadn't seen it before. There was an overturned table in the middle of the room. That's what I'd sprained my ankle on. Kicking it with my good foot, I revealed a crack in the dirt floor from which water came bubbling up. A few lily pads blopped up, their coloration a strange blue, like a sad sunflower. The crack in the floor might have been the remains of a well, or the start of a tunnel going deeper underground. Either way, I had to take a chance. There was no telling how deep it went. I could drown, but I could also find my way out. I left my cell phone with a flashlight shining on the entrance, holding the creature back. With a final screech, it conveyed a final picture. Webbed fingers, deep underground, tearing a human body to pieces. I took the plunge. I crawled my way forward, inch by inch. The wet dirt barely gave me any grip, and the water stung my eyes. My nails hurt from all the debris, trying to dig into my fingers. I could feel my chest tightening, cramping. A fork in the path, 
I went left. A current, a stream, brushing something slimy out of my face. I tilt upwards. Cold. I can't feel my arms. Hunger. Reaching. Hunger. I broke through the surface. I was in the stone well. I threw myself out, gasping for air, looking back, only to see something just under the surface of the overflowing well. Two black orbs retreated into the dark, sinking back into the unfathomable depths. I made my way to the nearest road and flagged down the first car I could see. Lacey Kettleman was brought in for questioning, but that's all I know. There was no trial, no debriefing. I just told about my experience to a stern-looking man in a suit, and that was that. I was told to sign an NDA lasting a minimum of 10 years. It ended recently, and I've been waiting to tell my story. And as Kettleman eventually took back control of the Oak Valley Grain Farm, as far as I know, Lacey never went to jail. Something must have happened though. She was missing for the better part of a decade. Maybe she had something they wanted. I think that whatever I met in Oak Valley had something to do with the crisis of 2013. There are a lot of rumors coming out of that area and I'm sure at least some of them originated with whatever Lacey had invited to stay in the cellar. There haven't been many others coming forward about their experience of that incident, but I know they're out there. Maybe they're hoping we've all moved on or forgotten. Maybe they've been safe behind their contracts and fear tactics. But I'd like to remind them, as much as I remind myself every day, everything breaks. <laughs>